Welcome back. Episode 51 of the Owl Triangle is here. It's back in your ears, back on your eyeballs. Andy Stevenson, Quilcher de Barra, and myself, Ian O'Neill, are here to take you through all the latest and greatest news in Irish mixed martial arts. Boys, how are we going? Andy, how is things in your life good, sir? What's up? Life is fantastic. I was in London last weekend. Had a lovely weekend watching fights uh, this weekend, so it's great. Just wrapped up a lovely interview as well. Life's good. 100%, 100%. We have Scott Harvey later on in the uh, in the podcast. A great interview with him ahead of his fight at Cage Warriors Dublin. Quilcha, what's happening in your neck of the woods? I have to say, you're wearing an absolutely beautiful yeah. hoodie. Could you okay. model that off for us, please? Oh, right wow. Absolutely Woo-hoo! wonderful. Even give you a bit of a turn there and all. Like, yeah, oh my God. Fashion. Instagram worthy, I think, this, you know. Uh, Paris, you're that Paris Fashion Week worthy, that now. That's what that is, huh? I need a pair yeah. of shorts to match now as well. You'll and, be getting off uh, for us to go up to the Devonish now if, if you're not careful looking that sexy. <laughs> They they, um, they don't allow clothes there, I'm afraid. So uh, I'd have to ditch the hoodie. So no, I have to keep this on. We we were chatting about that. I don't really. I'm not. I'm kind of out with a loop of what happened in Devish. Maybe it's not podcast worthy. What was going on up there with the side? Of, what was going uh, on? We'll up there? leave it at that. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave, leave it at that. What did Just, happen was the cage, uh, the cage conflict card, and we will talk about that later on. But any <laughs> other activities that's going on up there, I think we're we're best leaving it for now. But, we disassociate uh, from. <laughs> Oh god, we're off to a flyer here. I love oh, it. Real chef for anyone who's listening is wearing the new beautiful Owl Triangle hoodie. Um, the winner of the Owl Triangle of the Year 2023 will be getting that and a couple of other um worthy receivers of it as well. I know I'm waiting for mine to be delivered over to Canada and one is on the way to Andy too, so maybe we'll be all able to wear them for the next episode of the Owl Triangle. <laughs> so basically we're we're the worthy receivers. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. That's it. Well we don't we want to name anybody else, but Cap uh Capture Athletics designed the hoodies, fair play to them. They did a great job. Um go over and check their stuff out. I know they've to sponsor a lot of fighters, so shout out to Capture. Um you know, fair play to them. Let's uh, let's kick on, lads. The biggest news, I guess, that we we're going to open up with today on the Ultra Angle. Ian Gary um, picked up, Ian Machado Gary, I should say, picked up uh, a good win over Jeff Neal. Um, and I'd say good win, I mean, look, if I was being honest, I would say it was not his best performance inside the Octagon. Um, I think he fought very smartly. Uh, to kind of keep away from Jeff Neal's power and it and it needed to be done uh, and it does need to be done at certain stages of your career. Um, but I think the most important thing for Ian coming into this fight was the win. You know, you can't take any chances. With all the outside noise, with everything that was going on, Andy, um, heading into this fight and, and him pulling out of the fight with pneumonia, which, you know, could, could be affecting him as well. It's not a nice thing to have to get over to get in there and fight. He went in there and he got the job done, Andy, and that's the main thing. Yeah, that that is the main thing. Like I thought, I thought Ian did a, a great job of going in there, implementing a the game plan, and dealing with the task at hand. Because you know he he spoke about in interviews afterwards that he he knew he respected Jeff Neal's power. He knew he was go, you know, going in there with a really dangerous guy, and he managed to get the job done. Like I I, I don't think that. He, he was ever at risk in the fight which is you know says a lot um i thought that jeff neal did a lot of good work early on kind of coming in at angles and closing the distance and, and getting into that boxing range but i think that as the time wore on ian just did did a better job at, at, at keeping the fight at his pace at his range um and i wouldn't say cruising to victory but putting in a a uh, again workman like performance is wrong because I think it was it was better than that but you know not putting on the most exciting of fights for if you're a fan who's bought a ticket and wants to see two lads going and bludgeon the head off each other um but ultimately winning against a top 10 guy and, and moving on and and I think that's a job well done uh for him Gary especially when as you mentioned everything going on and you know a lot of eyes on you for this one but it's um yeah it's it's one of those ones where you, a lot of fighters have in their career. It's not going to be the most memorable fight of his career, but it's uh, it's one that'll stand to him uh, and pushes him on to to bigger fights and perhaps more entertaining fights in the division. A hundred percent, Quilcher. Like stylistically, look at we we talked about Jeff Neal coming in there with uh, big power, and we talked about it on the last episode and talking about this fight that you know Ian couldn't get caught in the pocket with a guy like Jeff Neal, um, and I think you know he showcased his level on the feet. 
and force Jeff Neal into clinch exchanges as well. If I was be super critical, and why I say super critical is because now we have to criticize or critique Ian Gary as a legit title contender in the UFC's welterweight division. And that's a good problem for us to have. But, you know, we got he's getting to that elite level status now. And I just think that this was more of a mental battle for him, more so than the physical battle that went on inside the cage grills. Is that the way that you kind of seen it? And and the performance that he produced as well was was one, as Andy says, is that sometimes you just have to get the, over the line no matter how you get it done. Uh, he's impressed in previous fights, and I'm sure that he will build off this performance as well and bring it into the next one. Yeah, I think a lot of this one was just getting in, getting the win and get out because it's that it's like a transitional p- a moment in the career of like going from this contender in the f- rankings to being a top contender going for a title. And it doesn't matter how you do it, it's just getting it done. So it's a case of just getting over that hurdle no matter what way possible. And that was the safest way possible, especially now that it allows him to go in again. He's probably going to be in, he's probably injury free afterwards. Like he looked fresh enough after as well. That's it's now kind of set him up nicely where he can take a a bigger fight and that could even you know that could be a bit more exciting and hopefully it will be but um yeah the main thing was getting the win, win in that one it seemed um fans probably you know not exactly too happy it wasn't the most memorable but it's probably going to be a big moment in the future for the progress of his career which is the most important thing at the end of the day 100 percent up next he called out Colby Covington, an ex- excellent call out. There's lots of options for Ian Gary right now. I know you were on with Pizzi, Andy. You were kind of discussing it yourself and Donna with Pizzi, the kind of what would be the next steps. You were, uh, without speaking for you, you're kind of leaning towards the Sean Brady fight, but are you more convinced of the Colby Covington fight right now? Or, or what no, are we thinking? No, I actually, I, so Pizzi was saying about, uh, he thought he, he would prefer Sean Brady, but I actually, oh, sorry, I did, I did say initially, when I saw Sean Brady's call out, I was like, oh yeah, I love a bit of that in Dublin. And I like, then, that. I like that too. But yeah, I mean, I, as you said, this is really positive. Like we're we're in a really positive place where Ian Gary is in the top ten of the division, going towards the top five of the division, and then potentially fighting for a title. This is class to be had to have an Irish fighter yeah. in this position. So uh, I would watch the shit out of out of a Sean Brady fight. But after hearing Ian on Ariel's show, I want Colby Covington. Like I just think that. Uh, you know, there's a anyone who's a Colby Covington fan probably not going to be an Ian Gary, Ian Machado Gary fan. Um, I don't think it, there's probably some sort of Venn diagram you can do where it's it's. Uh, I don't know what that fully looks like because I don't think it's a full. <laughs> like I also don't think that like if you're an, I think if you're an Ian Gary fan, you're not a Colby Covington fan. If you're a Colby Covington fan, you're not an Ian Gary fan. But I also think there's a there's a mesh of people in the middle who probably want both of them to lose. There's going or... to be a lot of hate watching for <laughs> yeah. that fight, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, Sean but... Strickland just watching on from the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd be very interested to see how Ian goes in because, like, I really think after watching Colby Covington fight Leon Edwards, he when if he was to go in against Ian Machado Gary, I think he'll have a lot of the similar problems uh, as he did in that fight. And I think, I think what this fight showed me is that Ian really takes into consideration his opponent's fighting style and will tailor a game plan towards that and I don't think that he will be fearful necessarily of Covington's wrestling so much and especially whatever the wrestling the grappling I don't think he's fearful of his the fact that he's saying he's got no power and he was previously saying I respect Jeff Neal's power I think he'll go in there and will pressure a lot more he won't be as evasive I think he'll stand there he'll kick the legs off Covington and he'll use his jab a lot more and I think that's a really exciting fighting style and then additionally you know if we can make if we can get this to happen where I know Ian's like oh I'll fight him wherever but if he can really just like no I want this in Dublin and push for it and if, if by hook or by crook we can get this UFC Dublin card what a main event that would be it would be serious like serious and I'd love for it to happen if I was to be honest I'd be sceptical of it happening in Ireland and not for not for Ian's case I think would Colby come over to Ireland to do it? I think he's in a position right now where it, the chances of that happening is better than it ever has been before in, in where Colby Covington is at in his career. But does he want to come to Ireland? Does he want, I think he'd, he'd flourish in the environment and he'd love being the enemy there in Ireland. He spoke out about Ireland before and, and everything like that. And I mean, he'd be the, he's the pantomime villain that Ian Gary needs in his career right now to kind of propel him to the next step. And I think in that term, Squilch as well, it's very smart thinking, do you know, where I, I you know, I don't know whether Ian Gary would have grown up, grew up imagining him being on the big stage in the UFC and having 
a big crowded arena booing him either. And that was obviously an adjustment that you'd have to make. Obviously, he took it in his stride and performed well. But it's also another little adjustment he has here. But as Andy was saying, a lot of people don't like Colby Covington. And maybe a lot of people might be near, leaning on cheering for Ian Gary in a fight of that magnitude. It's a lot of good options out there for Ian right now. There is. And the more I think about it, the more I love the Colby Covington one. I love to call out. You go back to the tweet from uh, Colby Covington to Carl Pendred back in the day or whatever Cody said. And um, it's like, Jesus, uh, I think you could really build a story about him making the pantomime villain, as you're saying, in Ireland. The other side of me really wants to see... I know it probably won't happen. I think we, a lot of us have nearly accepted that as the Stephen Wonderboy Thompson fight. There's just something about it that I would love ever so dearly about that because I think it would bring out a different style of Ian then because the, it could clash and be boring, but I think it could if Ian's adjusting his styles to his opponent, he could come out a completely different fighter than we've seen before. And part of me would love to see that as well. But um, options are fantastic. Uh, Colby Covington is probably top choice. But I'm over and back on that Stephen Wonderboy Thompson one as well. And I'd love to see that in Dublin. I think it'd be a, a worthy headliner as well. 100%. One last thing. The whole thing about him saying being too big for Ireland, I understand where he was coming from. I wish he had worded it a little bit better because there was that little bit of confusion around that. But we are getting to that stage where I think who's Ian Gary's next opponent is going to be and where the fight is going to be. If it's in Ireland... I think it's maybe a slimmer chance. We probably have a better chance of seeing maybe a Wonderboy Thompson who is ranked number five. So we have Ian still fighting up the rankings, fighting a legend, fighting the guy that he wanted to fight in, in the past. I think Wonderboy would make the trip over sooner than Colby would. Um, but if it's not, if it's on maybe potential Connor card in the summer on June 29th, you know, you could have that as a co main event. It would be an excellent co main event. It'd be Mayhem, Connor, Ian. And Colby on the one card is organized chaos, if you ask me. But let me be let me simplify it, guys. I'll ask you straight up. Not 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 who you wanted to be, Andy. Who do you think it's going to be next for Ian Gary? I t- I genuinely think I think Colby Covington will happen. Yeah. Um yeah. where will it be in Ireland or not? Will it be I would say if Colby is next, unfortunately, and I wish it wasn't this way, i I doubt it's in Ireland. I think they do it on a on a Vegas card in a Comey and event slot for sure. What about you, Quilcha? What do you think? Who do you think next and where do you think next? And... Oh, I want to play devil's advocate here. I'm going to go uh, Sean Brady in Dublin and oh, uh, try and bring really? expectations down a little bit because uh, I think... I, I mean, know. I'll take that. If that's expectations, yeah. Yeah, no, I'll take that. Expectations from the Kofi Covington <laughs> fight, of course. But uh, yeah. that might be the more favourable matchup for the Irish fans, really. 100%. Just, 100%. Just one yeah, more thing, Andy Gary. I, we always, I always do this. You know, as I said before the podcast started, I won't, I won't, I won't. No, no, go fire it. I'm going to do it anyway. As you mentioned, Ian, there about the, the stuff about you know, being too big for Ireland, Ian sometimes doesn't communicate, I think, what he the means message. in his head, and it, and it gets lost in translation a little bit. If he were to get matched with Colby Covington, Quilcher referenced it there. The quote that Colby Covington had to Carl Pendred was, I will bury Cahill Pendred like the British buried the Irish. If I am Ian Gary, whatever, let's forget about all the Team KF stuff. You go in there and say, this man once said to my former teammate and, and training partner and, and coach that he was going to bury him like I buried the Irish. I'm going to come in here and bury you, Covington, and do it for all the Irish people. And Because all the Irish fans want is to feel that there's a connection there, that you care about them, that you're doing this for Ireland as well. And that, I think, just jump on that and it's 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 an alley-oop for you. A hundred percent, yeah, spot on. And you and you can create that narrative no matter where that fight is taking place in the world as well. But like Andy said, we have another Irish fighter, no, whether, no matter what your opinion is of, of Ian Shadow, Gary, we have an Irish fighter that is number six in the world in the welterweight division in the UFC. And look at that's a phenomenal achievement for a little country like Ireland and the fighters that they've developed. Like I remember watching Connor come up and thinking, you know, and, and I know I want to kind of steer away from the car- comparison between Ian and Connor, but I think Ian and Car Connor do have a, a similar comparison where their personalities are not quite maybe understood or accepted by a lot of people and because of that people will want to bring down their level of ability or kind of snuff on how good of a fighter that Bo Connor was and and still is and and Gary is right now to this day and I think you know just take off the blinkers and realize that we have a really special talented fighter here in Ian Gary was only 26 years of age and on the cusp of top five competition in the UFC 
we really got to focus on that. It's really cool that, that we have that right now. That's a that's a great point. Great point. Yeah. It, it is like twenty six. It's mad. It's crazy. It's crazy. And one final thing on Ian Gary before we move on. A lot of talk about media, this and that, and not doing media. We can say on the Owl Triangle, we were offered an interview with Ian ahead of the fight. We, unfortunately, the, the schedule didn't allow us to take that too. But, uh, you know, there was a bit of drama about over that. There was a lot of things said as well. But, um, you know. Well, what, what I, okay, yeah. What I would say, if we're being completely transparent. We tried a couple of times. <laughs> it was, we, we reached out a few weeks prior to when we got the... Yeah, not complaining, but you know, it was, it was, it was, it would have been very difficult to organize. Yeah, it was a bit of last minute, and we would have liked to have gotten him a little bit sooner, but hopefully, we can make it happen down the line sometimes. Yeah, and, it's all uh, good, it's all good, it's all good, no yeah. worries at all. And and he, we got one with Sean and, and himself as well over on Severe as well. So, um, yeah, look at all things are good in the world of Ian Gary right now. Let's move along. Not great news for Bellator Belfast. Uh, Liam McCourt or yeah, Liam McCourt is out with an injury. The fight with Sinead Kavna is off, unfortunately, and um, yeah, that's a big blow to the card, isn't it, lads? It's like you know that was a fight that oh, he was de- especially after listening to Sinead uh, when she was on with us last. Um, you know, she really built that fight up, and it was very disappointing. A couple of days later, um, Leah got injured. It was a rib injury, Andy, I believe. Um, and she and she uh, released a post on on details of the injury as well. Just disappointing to to see that for Leah, isn't it? Yeah, really disappointing. I mean, it sounds like it's a really, firstly, a really rough injury for Leah. Like it sounds like she had, she had uh, broken a rib, and then additionally, I think she tore the the ligaments. Or I, I'm forgetting. I should have referenced this before we we went on because I, I we had the exact uh, kind of transcript of her of her, her diagnosis, but she tore them. Um, I think it was her um, oblique as well. Uh, so like it, it sounds like she was in limbo the last time I was speaking to her around whether surgery was needed. So it look it's kind of probably a bit unclear at the moment as to whether or how long she'd be out for it. I saw she was posting up that she was going to start in a rehab and things like that. So just really unfortunate. Um, obviously, Sinead gave a very fiery and, and a brilliant interview with us on the last episode. And I really felt that, you know, uh, the first fight was very respectful and I thought it was a very interesting and intriguing matchup, especially, you know, two Irish women at the, the top of their games at the time. You have the rematch now and there was a bit more bite to it. So there's kind of a new angle for fans to cut their teeth into. Um obviously you kind of you're only out the gate and and, and it's gone now. So very unfortunate. Yeah, hundred percent. Um Quilcha on that card, that leaves a big hole now. Anyone that you'd like to see maybe that that we could be looking at to put on that car to kind of spice things up again. I know a big name for me that stands out is Brian Moore. I know he hinted at, you know, a possible matchup coming up. I'd love to see him on that Bellator Belfast card. And uh, I'm surprised he hasn't been matched up for it yet. But uh, what what are you thinking? Anybody else? Maybe I'm, I'm sure you're the same sentiment with, with Brian as well and on that car. But it's a big hole to have to fill now after Lee and Sinead dropped off. It is, and just on the Leah thing, it's it's a massive fight to drop off, and it's a massive thing for I imagine for Leah as well, because I, as far as I'm aware, she hasn't got the opportunity to fight in Belfast as a professional yet, and that would have been a big opportunity, a big moment for her. So it's hopefully she gets to have that again in the future, and potentially a big fight. In terms of filling the gap, look, it's going to be very difficult to fill a hole in that card with uh, that fight dropping off. Uh, from the top of my head, I think Brian Moore will have to be in agreement with you there, like, um it came as a bit of a shock to, that he wasn't on in the first place, to be honest with you, because um, like he was around the Bellator scene for so long. He was one of the first Irish fighters in Bellator that actually it, you thought he'd be one of the first names to hop on this card in the first place. But uh, yeah, he's the number one for me to be added to it. Hopefully he gets added to it. I have a few other gripes with the card as well in terms of where certain fights are placed mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. But sure, I think that's a con- I- another conversation. Yeah, like here in Clark's opponent, well, it's another useless placement and a not really that like exciting of opponent, really, Andy, as well on that card. You have Nate Kelly on the undercard who's gone from headline and as well, you know, like that's all right. But I definitely think with Kieran Clark and the body of work that he's put in, um, deserves better placement, deserves a bigger name as well, in my opinion. I'm sure you'll feel the same too, Andy. Yeah, I mean, like the cheese, like I, I saw Kieran's opponent and like, like all of his wins are against two and forty five, zero and two. Uh, some lad whose topology record has been stricken because he's ineligible. Another lad with the twenty twenty nine record, 
and then uh, a pro debut. So like he's a four and one, but like when you look into it a bit more, it's it's not great. And that's not Kieran's fault. Like I I don't I don't understand what they're doing. Kieran has shown himself to be a really really good fighter. He's undefeated. He's got. I feel like he's been building hype around him, and also he brings a crowd with him uh, wherever he goes. If you put up interviews with him, like a lot of people engage with Kieran Clark's career. So, you know. <sighs> It's frustrating, I think, because I think he's ready for that next step up. And we've kind of been talking about this. It seems like it's Groundhog Day a bit with Kieran, and, and this actually I would see as a as a step down an opponent to his last yeah. one. And I know he's 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 at a new well, he's not really at a new weight class. He went down a weight class, so I, I, I yeah, I, I just don't. It really... reeks to me. It reeks to me of PFL saying, "Here's Kieran Clark, a good undefeated fighter, a good ticket seller. Let's just put him on this card against somebody so that he's on the card rather than you know focusing on building him." into a maybe con- title contention into like more of a meaningful fight and it seems like we we're having the same conversation about Kieran and he's such a nice guy that he's not going to be a one that's going to be complaining exactly. or giving out about it or fighting his corner as well and you know sometimes when you're like that organizations can take advantage of it too at the same time and you know that's what I guess what we'll do we'll do the giving out for him here on the podcast I guess but you know it'd be nice and I hope that we get to chat to Kieran ahead of that fight maybe pick his brain about that a little bit more and um, you'd like to see him almost go into like a, a tournament format or something like, else. Oh, yeah, he, oh, yeah. I said no. to you guys right you had right and you no, know, Clarissa Shields is going to catch a few strays here right <laughs> Yeah, like fair play to her, right? She went in there and she competed on the Bellator and PFL card. Uh, she was, I don't know what her record was, one and one going in and she fought a one and two woman. And, you know, it was a, a bad quality fight. And Clarissa is a big name, obviously, but is she fully committed to mixed martial arts? I would say no. But why not give someone like Kieran Kirk an opportunity on a card like that on the undercard just to kind of showcase your up and coming talent? They want to do it with that... Uh, Baggio Ali Walsh and they label him even though he says I want to be my own fighter they'll still label him as Muhammad Ali Ali's grandson every moment that they can get and it's like they want these they want these names and these kind of people that will draw more eyes rather than focusing on like the, if you want to develop a promotion you have to really bank on developing the talents that you have the people that are committed to mixed martial arts and want to make a, a, a full on run at being world champion world best elite level and I, I don't know it's it's fucking frustrating to me sometimes to be honest and they do like if you look at the Bellator Belfast card as well they'll do it with some fighters because James Gallagher's going in and fighting the number one guy in the division mm. yeah and like James obviously a huge name big massive ticket seller a star uh, under the Bellator banner um, so they're happy to do it with him but but I don't know uh, it, it's yeah, it's it's a weird one. We we'll look at hopefully we we'll get the chance to talk with Kieran and, and see what way uh, things work out. We we'll move on to a card that is a little bit closer to home. One that you know we were hoping that we would see a lot more Irish talent on as well, and that's the the PFL Paris card, which is going down on March seventh. I know we were even joking with you, Quilce, about this card about you know the potential of uh, being stacked with Irish talent. Now we do have Andreas Spinder on there, and we are looking forward to seeing his. Uh, debut. Uh, we also have Daniel Scatizzi in there as well from SBG uh, against Shizov and um, uh, and Andreas is taking on uh, Mark Ewan from higher level. I believe he's he's going yeah. in in Scotland. So um, a good fight for Andreas. Obviously that opponent changed as well. We got different reports, and I think you got you reported originally, and then with the opponent change as well, Andy. This a bit of a strange situation with Andreas here as well. He was originally again uh, scheduled to go against Chizov, but then Chizov got put into the tournament. So mm-hmm. Chizov's going in against Daniela Skatizi now. So uh, and then additionally on the card, Claudio uh, Pacella, Pacella, I'm not sure. He's an SPG guy too. So uh, we're mm-hmm. the other Italians. So there's two two uh, SPG Italians on the card here. But yeah, um, I, I forget what the question is now. <laughs> yeah, no, oh yeah, I do. See, I, I missed him on the card. There's no real question. It was just more an observation. Look at with no Irish talent on the card, obviously we talked talk to Dylan Took about his situation, which ruled him out. Uh, John Mitchell obviously was unfortunate enough and uh, picked up an injury, was unable to compete. Where's Franz Malambo on this card? Is what I, I have. And he wants to fight as well. Um, you know, it seemed that there was a lot of excitement and the wanting to build this Irish talent last year. And it's kind of, you know, for some, for some reasons outside the PFL's control as well, it seems to be a little bit gone by the wayside. Uh, starting off here but like I said all is not lost we do have Andreas in here with Mark Ewan and and that is a, a decent fight wheelchair you know Ewan is a, a good young up and comer undefeated as well coming out of higher level 
um, all finishes in all five of his five professional fights. We've been following Andreas as well, been on a very good run recently coming in, obviously, off his win against Aiden Lee. Um, big thing here, the big asterisk, I guess it is, is, you know, Andreas needs to focus his attention on making weight. Obviously, that didn't happen for him ahead of the Dublin fight. Um, and uh, it'll be uh, the battle with the scales first before the battle with Mark Ewan, won't it? Yeah, it's the big question surrounding this one, and it, it's good he got the opportunity again as well. Like after last time, it, you could have been very easily thrown to the wayside after that. To be very honest, uh, big opportunity, you could, and that happening. But a uh, tough fight, you know. He's like going in there, and it's like two. It's basically two really big prospects in their own in their own right going against each other and kind of battling it out. And I love that. I think the kind of the matchmaking here is top notch. Uh, it could, I'd say, arguably this could be. Could end up being his toughest fight today. I think Aiden Lee was maybe, I don't know if you'd mark that, rank that higher, but uh, this could be his toughest fight today and probably his biggest opportunity today. But uh, first up is the scales. And uh, I hope hope all goes smoothly and we actually get to see the fight happen this time. But uh, that is the big question. I do want to point out one thing, though. That Claudio Pacella fight is an absolute cracker. Now, you know me, I love it. I love a good prospect that are unknown. But this, I watched your man. I watched your man, Claudio. What what fight was it that he had? Um, oh God, when he, he fought in the Irish scene recently enough, didn't he? Um, he did. And Premier was it or something? Or or? Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm blanking. He fought, he fought he, Alexander Yankov on that was Ur, yeah. fighting championship seven. Yeah, and it was a great yeah. fight as well. And he's coming in against Patrick Habu- Habuaria, is, Habibora. who is the Habibora. And this guy has been absolutely storming it at the IMAF. So I remember seeing this guy fight. He he was knocking guys out left, right, and center on the IMAF scene, isn't he? Is this the guy? Am I thinking correctly? This is him. Yeah, he's oh, he's different gravy. He just seemed like I remember in Italy, he was one of those lads you look at and think, Jesus, he's something. There's something about him. That little stardom about him. And uh, then he just went on this knockout streak and did the same again at the most recent Worlds. And like, it's not like look at the IMAF, like you know you don't usually see strikers that much. I think it's a commonly known thing. Like you're not going to see really striking lads uh, achieve, achieve that much. Um, but he was, he was just went against the grain. And I think this type of booking is just, oh, the fireworks are written all over it. I cannot wait for this one, to be honest. Nice one. Nice one. You've definitely sold me as well. Any final thoughts, Andy, before we move on? I'm I'm going to take a, a respectful counterpoint to you, Ian, for earlier mm-hmm. on. Um, because I think your point is more around the the lack of involvement of Irish fighters within the tournaments themselves. You know where there was a lot more of a focus. It seemed going in, you know, kind of last year, the start of these European seasons with the Irish fighters, and there doesn't seem to be that kind of continuity. And obviously, we've we've a couple where you know Tuca has, has failed the the drug test mm-hmm. for weed and, and Mitchell injured, etc. I I'm looking at the card. I actually think it's brilliant, and I, I'm I'm wondering is it more to do with a lack of like are we overvaluing the focus on Irish MMA, like are, are we well, seeing? Oh, we definitely are, bro. Because that's because we're an yeah. Irish MMA podcast. No, <laughs> I know, but but like the card overall there is, shift, is, is there a shift away from like because I'm like the, the Doom, like Doom Bay is obviously an attraction himself. Lazy King, I think, versus Jack Rant is a brilliant fight. Um, the the anyway, back to sorry, we're getting offhand here, but back back to the Irish, uh, like Binder. Uh, it's great to see Binder on there. I do yeah. think that we we may be like it'll be very interesting to see how how Irish MMA goes in PFL and Bellator and how they handle that because we've seen the likes of Kenny Mokinwana and we've seen Richie Smullen who have re- requested releases and it's going to be interesting to see now because like there's a lot of fighters on here who I'm looking at like, like Kane Musa and all, all these guys I'm like they are these are solid fighters on here and, and I think that I don't know how much involvement there will be from from Irish MMA in comparison to maybe the last couple of years which will be which is pure speculation I, I don't I know think one thing that I would add onto that is is one complaint that we were having with Irish talent within Bellator was the not having enough opportunity to compete, right? And it and for me, without knowing too much, but looking from the outside in, if you're not a part of that tournament, your chances of fighting multiple times in a year might be slim and none. And that, that's maybe I maybe should have reiterated that side of things as well that I'm focusing on. Whereas that, you know, we want to see the level of activity. You have Franz Malamba out there saying that he wants to fight right now. And the next card here is not until June. So we've gone six months into the, the the calendar year and we've only seen one Irish guy compete on the PFL. Um, that's, that's a fair point. So he so he should be put on like a Bellator 
Dublin card or a Belgian or Belfast card then just month for, yeah just because just they're, they're doing 155 170 tournament here for this card so clearly they're you know they do or, their schedule just put them on a showcase fight but if, if yeah. you're not putting fans back into the, the tournament bracket just put them in a, a in a in a showcase fight on one of these cards as well and it's like you know we're kind of maybe getting into those bad habits of not allowing these fighters um to be as active as they would like and maybe the likes of Richie and the likes of Kenny might have made that decision for activity I think Kenny even tweeted that out himself it was like the shack is like free man free man this is Bellator Bellator all over right that was for sure and I should have probably made that point a little bit clearer at the start but how's it never um, look we'll talk about the card great card overall I I just want to make sorry one more point Uh, just because I I was kind of not focusing on on what we have at hand here and that's Andreas Spinner because I actually think this is a really really fun matchup I think it's a solid very hard to call fight Uh, I think I've watched a bit of Mark Ewan he's undefeated 5-0 and I think that he's very technical he'll set up a lot of traps and feints and you know if Binder allows him to kind of uh, make it kind of like almost like a kickbox and spar um, you know that that may play into Ewan's hands but I think what Binder does brilliantly is is kind of making it a fight making it a a fight and he's got the power in his hands I think he's got the boxing uh, and he obviously has the judo background so I think this is a really interesting matchup and if you can if you can get the win here, I think it's really positive. And you know, with a with a bit of luck or 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 lack of luck for someone else, you could find himself falling into the the tournament if someone you know pulls up with, with an injury along the way. So um, that's obviously the Irish uh, focus and spotlight for this card. Hundred percent, no, very well said, and a great fight. And look at we we spoke about our delight of Andreas getting the opportunity. Uh, I'm sure. Look at. The uh, last fight was a big wake up call for him with the with the weight miss. It's just unfortunate timing there. It happens. It happens. Uh, and it, and you know it's a thing that exists. Uh, but hopefully things go well uh, in regards to the wake up. We get to see him competing in there. That's March seventh. Uh, that PFL card as well. Um, moving on, another exciting fight. We're talking about exciting fights. Well, one that was announced just last week was uh, Scott Harvey signing to Cage Warriors and the fact that he's going to be fighting Enrico De Gangi on April 6th. Uh, Cage Warriors 170 in Dublin in the RDS. And we're going to speak to Scott right now about that fight, about the announcement, plans, and lots of other stuff as well. So we'll head on over there and hear what Scott has to say. I'll hand it over to Andy. And now we are joined by a man who is in the news because he's just signed with Cage Warriors and he is due to fight on the Cage Warriors Dublin show coming up on the 6th of April. None other than Scott. I hear Scotty Too Hottie Harvey. That's the name we're going with, is it? How are you, Scott? I'm good. I'm good, mate. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Um, Everything's everything's tipping over. Um, Yeah, delighted with the news. The news that that obviously we we got announced the other day. Um, It's exciting. Um, I was only obviously saying to you before we came on there that this was obviously planned to happen a lot, a lot earlier. Well, not a lot earlier, but but it should have probably happened sooner. Um, last year the goal was was to make that push um, for for Cage Warriors, and we just had so many. We just had setback after setback. I think I had like a, a really like it was just an unlucky year. It was nobody's nobody's fault. Nothing nothing happened. It was just one of those things that just wasn't destined to happen last year. So. Um, I was matched last year to fight. I can't remember his name. Some other, some some other Italian. I seem to always get matched with Italians. I'm starting to think I am like Bowser. Like I am just out for like the Mario <laughs> Brothers style. Like so, um, I was matched with another Italian man on on Cage Conflict. But in the build up to that, I think probably like maybe a month out from that. No, maybe like a month before we'd announced that I was fighting. I just I kept getting staff infection. I just could not get rid of it. I got a staff infection, and it, it didn't. It was it was the same one. I hadn't actually been training. I'd, I'd I'd been to the hospital and stuff, been to the doctors, and I got staff, and it started off just obviously on my chest and spotted it straight away and, and done a course of antibiotics. And I I'd never. I think the last time I'd probably had it before that, probably talking like six or seven years ago. To be completely honest, it would have been back when I first started training, and. Um, yeah, got got staff infection and then done all the usual protocol that you do. Go, got got antibiotics. Went and it was completely out of the gym for for close to close to a month, and it went away. It, it looked like it went away, and then only like maybe a week or two after I finished the antibiotics, I noticed a tiny little spot on my left eye, and bang, got staff infection on my eyelid. Really, like it was pretty bad on my eyelid. Um, 
Oh, I have photos of it there. You probably don't want to see them, but they're, they're there somewhere. Um, and again, it was really, really bad. And then I started reading all these mad stories of people that have had like staff go into their eye and then it goes into your brain and it can kill you and all sorts. And I was like, oh my God, that's the last thing I need. So um, I think it happened with a case with a fella, and I could be completely mistaken here, but I'd heard that happened with a case with a fella in John Donahue's gym in, in New York where his eye, his, his, his contact lens fell out on the mat and he put it back in. And he got uh, he got staff on his eyeball and it, it travels straight to the brain and then it's that's got to there. So I, I've never actually heard of anybody getting it on their eyeball. Obviously, staff is quite common everywhere, but to get it on your eyelid or in around your eye areas, geez, that must have been scary, man. Yeah, so like I mean, when I say it was on like the tip of my eyelid, so like touching my eyelashes. Um, so we had that, and then I done the the, the antibiotics again. I think I done maybe three. I think one week I done. I was doing eight antibiotics a day for like over a week, yeah, for, to, just to try and get rid of it. And then eventually it cleared up. It literally it cleared up then and we were like, right, brilliant. So then I took a week off after I finished them just to let them all flush out. And I think it gave me like, while I was doing this, I was kind of dieting as well because I was, I was technically matched at this point. We were like, right, we do still want to make a push because the plan was to fight cage war, uh, cage conflict and then push for cage war at the end of the year then. So, okay, so start trying to get another fight in and that would have been the move towards cage rise and hopefully then 4-0 and when I was going across there and then potentially finishing the year 5-0. and That was the goal. Um, and then I think it was like my first or second week, I think it might have been my first week back then, broke my hand and straight away, completely snapped my arm, thrown a 1-2. I literally was like, and, and you know what, there was a peach of a shot, but I don't know if any is... Obviously, he's already speaking to Ternan, and, and you've seen what Ternan Lockman's like. He is made of alamantium, that man. So, I suggest if anyone's ever fighting Ternan, like, my recommendation would be just grab a baseball bat. <laughs> so, just, was were you punching Ternan when you broke your hand? Ternan, yeah, yeah. So, you, you probably would have been better punching the wall, to be honest. If I hit the wall, my hand probably would have survived, but it hit Ternan and completely just exploded and just snapped. So then I had to go and get surgery on that, and then I have a big rad scar the whole way up the back of my hand where that lives. So metal plate in there now, so I can hit him with this now. Now it's made of metal, but yeah, when it was just mere bone, it couldn't survive. It's mad. I feel like I've seen a couple of times lately on social media where lads basically complaining that Tiernan Lochran's head is is too solid. The Lochran's are, are made of sturdy I'm stuff. Telling you God, right? So so like the Lochran's are half human. And I hope they don't take offense to this, but they're half human, half like full breed bull terrier. Like, <laughs> some, some sort of like, if like a Rottweiler and a bull terrier joined heads, you may have like a half a locker in head. Yeah. Like, <laughs> cannot, like, you just can't hit him. Like, it, it's so, yeah, so my hand exploded, and then we were just like, you know what? This is just, it just wasn't meant to be. That's what we were taking from it. I was like, if I was meant to make that push, I would have made that push. So um, exciting news though is obviously now, now we are making that move. Um, and, and I'm excited to get my name out there. That's that's the main thing. Yeah, I mean, that must have been very frustrating because I like I remember speaking to you after your pro debut yeah. and it was, you, you hadn't fought in like two, two and a bit years at that time. Yeah. And, from there, you've had a flawless pro career so far, and you've been yeah. fighting relatively regularly. Obviously, the last time we saw you was last April. Yeah. Um, but to then kind of be stuttered, not through any fault of your own, other than injuries, staff, like that must be quite frustrating. Yeah. It's just annoying, yeah. Because, and you know what it is? Like, uh, you've probably heard this as well from the lads in the gyms that, like, like Liam and Pat and all are obviously that they're, 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 they're pushing us, they always support us and everything they do, but they're always pushing us, and they always want us to be looking to improve and improve and improve and get better and, and, and look for these good important fights that are going to develop us and and for me I'm like looking at all these other lads like last year was frustrating because like you're so happy for your teammates but you're like I should be doing that do you get what I mean like Corey McLaughlin goes on a tear Tiernan goes on a tear like Paul has a big finish to the year Paddy goes on like you know, all these lads that you're around that you're around, like, like I just like it's there do you get what I mean it's there I just gotta I just gotta get it and so that was a little bit frustrating but I kind of like, I was like, you know what, it, 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 like I said, like it, it's one of those things where I was like, it is what it is. If I just sit, if I just be patient and and just ride out this bad period, I knew it was just a bad period. So I was like, if I just ride this out, um, once it clears, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be on the home stretch. And how, I know you mentioned there that the, you have a like kind of a metal thing in your hand right now. How is the hand? 
to train. Hand solid, 100%. Um, so they brought me in and they done a surgery. So what happened was when the, when the bone broke, so like let's just say like that's a day, like mine was kind of like twisted like off a little bit um, straight through the center of like the metacarpal. So when they brought it in, they gave me like a week and they, they put a cast on it and they, they were like, come back to us in a week time. We'll have a look at it. We'll do another x-ray and we'll see how it's developing. But when I went back in for the second x-ray, it actually showed on the second x-ray that it, it shifted even further. The bone had moved even more. Um, I actually think that might have been fault my own. I was trying to put on a pair of jeans. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a slight bit of blame on that. I tried to put on a pair of jeans. I was getting impatient and I pulled them up with, with, my, with my cast on. And I think that's what might have moved it a bit. But... Um, you need to you need to buy looser jeans, man. <laughs> <laughs> the bundle, like the bun is big, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm all all glutes, no quads. Like <laughs> Ross Keller and friends there pulling up the pair of leather pants. That's what it was like. So I put them on, and that's the only thing I can remember. But whatever happened, it ended up shifting a little bit, and then they they brought me in, and they were like, "Here, it's moved. So we've got two options. We can reset it, and then put the cast back on, or we can go in for surgery." And they were like, "The thing is, with the surgery is obviously I'll have a scar, but they were like, you'll." Uh, your recovery rate will be quicker. The the metal will obviously keep the bone secured pretty much indefinitely while it while it heals. So I was just like, I'm really care about the scars. Like if it means that I can actually get back to using my hands sooner and I can I can I can fight with it again and it'll 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 be a little bit more secure than I was like, yeah, let's go with that option. So you have a man up there in FAI that could write a book on hand injuries and Paul Hughes. Oh well here, I'll tell you this is the funny thing. So this is and Paul probably vouched for this because so after I broke my hand, right, I actually have a video of like the this, this spar when I done it. So I landed the shot, whatever, and I knew something was wrong. Like, so I, I felt it straight away. I was like, my hand's really sore here. Like, I definitely done my hand. But when I was trying to make a fist, it felt really funny trying to make a fist. So in my head, I was like, did I dislocate my finger? I thought I'd like maybe move my finger a bit. And I was like trying to spar here and not get my head taken off, like moving around while like trying to like casually move my finger potentially back into place and we took off the gloves and obviously you can see like there's like a lump in the middle of my hand and me and Paul were looking at it and Paul was like I don't know if that's moved like if the metacarpal's broken and shifted down or if like your 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 knuckle like if, if something is maybe moved out of place and he's like well, we try and move it back down and I was just like yeah, why don't we? I was like, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. So me and Paul <laughs> said after breaking your hand, so yeah, let me just try and move it back down. So Paul's like putting his hand over the top of it and like using his thumb to like push the bone back down. It didn't really work. It was just Does, does Paul think that he's a doctor now? <laughs> to yeah, yeah, that like, he's, yeah, yeah. Doctor Hughes on the on the on the case, you know. Yeah, I'm sure he gave you some good advice though in terms of rehabbing because a hand injury yeah. obviously it's very it's it, you have to be very careful with it, like do you know what his, 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 uh, his advice was? And, and, and it is, it's brilliant advice because some of, it's one of those things that a lot of people don't, and he says the mistake that he's made is that, is, is rushing it. It's just be patient. It's that like, I think obviously with his hand injuries in the past, he's probably come back a little bit too quick and then that's what's led to, led to re-breaking it or having further issues and complications down the line. Whereas by me just leaving it, I was just like, I just, when it happened, I can't remember the exact date it happened, but I kn- I knew I was like, I could probably get back to doing something maybe before the end of the year. But I was like, I'm just going to take the rest of the year. I'll take January as well. I'll get back into the swing, swing of things in, in January. And I still stay busy. Like, I still don't pass with the lads and, and done what you can around it. But I just tried to avoid much contact with it. And, and it, well, this actually funny enough. So after I got the operation, I think it was like a week after I got the operation. Oh, no, it would have been like two weeks after I got the operation. They did say to me, obviously, there's like all the stitches in the back of your hand and, and, and it's healing up. And before, probably like, yeah, it would have been like two, two and a half weeks after the operation, the scar got infected. And they said to me, they actually thought it might have been the metal. So they said that it is common. It's, it's not common, but it can happen that that the metal, when when it, the, the body senses, like obviously a foreign, foreign object going into it, that sometimes it can reject it. And, they, they thought that maybe that would have been the case and it did and then they put me back on more antibiotics again so at this point I was like I am turning into an antibiotic at this point <laughs> I have, I more or less don't have a gut health anymore we'll just like I feel like I'm turning into Gordon Ryan I'm going to be like the stomach that just doesn't work anymore but um, no thankfully my stomach's fine and, and it did heal up so but it was yeah. just one thing after another yeah 
So. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that you're back to, to full health anyway. Yeah. Um, and look, there's there's a lot we can talk about, about yeah. you know, what's coming next, etc. Et but, but first, I want to kind of peel it back a little bit. And for anyone who's listening, who's maybe, I think most people will know this already, uh, but we maybe we have a few listeners that are from outside Ireland. Uh, Scott is, is you mentioned there, training with Paul Hughes. He's living in Belfast. He's training up at FAI. But believe it or not, that is not a Belfast accent that you hear. Uh, so who, who is, you know, who is Scott Harvey for anyone who, who is unfamiliar with you? Like, what was life growing up for you? Where did you grow up? So I actually, yeah, so I am originally from Dublin. So I grew up in Ballymun. So I don't know if obviously people who are maybe not not aware of, of Dublin or, or Ireland. Ballymun, I like to refer to as like the Baghdad of, of Ireland. It's uh, nah, it's pretty rough as toast, like, but it's, it's it's good. I love it. Like, I love Ballymun, but that's where I grew up originally. Um and I started training in MMA when I was roughly, I think I was around 19 when I started training, 18, 19. So I wasn't super young. I haven't, well, I didn't start when I was like a kid, but I was still pretty new. Like I'm, I'm 30 now, so I was still pretty new to, to the sport. wasn't what it is now at the time. I think Conor was still in. I think Conor McGregor was still in cage wires at this time, and and he was still making his rise. So that's when I started MMA, and I originally trained under under our own Ruddy. SPG, it was it was primal MMA at the time, um, so I originally started training there with, with Roddy, and that's where I was for for many many years. Um, I I done that I done all my amateur career there, and actually made my pro debut still technically under under the SPG banner, but I had moved up to up to the north end. And the missus love pulled me pulled me north of the border. Um, so, so that's where I am now. But originally, that's what I would have done. So I done uh, amateur. I done the IMAFs. I done I had like I can't even remember my amateur record to be completely honest. Uh, I don't even know if it wasn't that great. But I do remember I always fought good lads. I do remember that. Like I had fights with Paul Hughes. I fought Matty Elliott. I fought like I fought obviously Andrew Barr was a good lad. I fought um, Eric Nolan. Eric Nolan. Team Nolan. Team I couldn't think of Eric Nolan from Team Rhino. Like, so I always fought lads that were, that were good. I never really shied away from like from fighting good lads, and I think that reflected in my record a bit. But um, that would have been me for, from the start. Was was Ballymun and, and fighting under Roddy, and then when we made the transition then up to the north, we were like, right, there was a six month window where I didn't train. I didn't actually know what gym to go to or what to do. MMA was there was a brief period where I was like. I just go and get a nice crusty job and sit in an office and just ride this out to the sunset now. And I was like, <laughs> but I was like, nah, it's just so much. Like, you just, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I just really enjoy training. I'm just really enjoying MMA. So I was like, oh, no, maybe do something else. And then it really did. Like, when I went, to, when, I, when I transitioned across then to, to FAI, I really, like, reinvigorated, reinvigorated my, my passion for MMA and, and, and made me really want to pursue that pro, that pro route. Yeah. Scott, when you went just to bring back to the amateur bit for a second, yeah. obviously you when you were you were debut back in 2014-15. Yeah. And it wouldn't uh, I guess over the years, I think span across five years, you didn't really get to be that active on the no. scene as what 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 was that about? Why couldn't you be as active and now how are you using that to I guess try and make up for lost time in the pro ranks nearly? Um, I don't you know what it was. I always trained. Like this is the thing. Like I, I didn't fight as much as I'd like, and maybe it was mistakes on my part. It was it was mistakes on my part. Mistakes on like there was loads of like moving parts that I think kind of culminated in that. Like like so at the time when I was starting, I think I should have pushed more. I think one of the big things I regretted when I started MMA was I, f- I fought too light, which sounds ridiculous, but I didn't know anything about weight cutting. And I thought back then, like you're dealing with, like when I started MMA, it was like you said there, 2014. There was knees to the head. There was everything. It was just, it was just a, a digger match. It was great. It was like you're gonna put on six ounce gloves that you're gonna try actually get away with four ounce gloves if you can. Knees to the head. There was just no elbows. That was the only difference. Like, but I think I was just, I was like, oh no, like I want to cut weight. I want to make myself really lean. I want to fight at these weights. I want to do this whole approach to things. I didn't know enough about it and it nearly like turned me off MMA, like that the, the aspect of fighting. Do you know what I mean? And then another thing is that like I wasn't necessarily like confident. Do you know what I mean? Like most people when they when they do MMA, like you always hear of everyone's like, they want to just fight everyone, I want to do this, I want to do this. And they always think that I never really I was always really just like ah, if it happens, it happens. Like if you get me a fight, I'll fight. 
if you don't get me a fight, like, I'm just going to still just show up every day and try it. You know what I mean? I think I'd do a lot better being being pushed. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Mm. And maybe some fighters and maybe amateurs that are coming up might might hear that and be like, well, do you know what? That makes sense. Because, like, fighting's not for everyone. And it's so easy to just be like, nah, I don't want to be a fighter. You know what I mean? And, and I think I battled with that for a long time i was like i really like fighting but i also don't like fighting and i like fighting and i don't like fighting and it just took me a long time to realize that i was like no like the thing you want to actually re- the thing that you really really enjoy doing is on the other side of that like that balancing act of like being a bit too afraid to fight and wanting to fight you know what i mean so i was like being pushed a little bit more now in the, in the pro ranks is, is definitely something that's that's going to be beneficial for, for me and for me development definitely yeah but i'm a chap I think that was one of the things that I missed. Obviously, I had injury spells like everyone, but they're not, they weren't really excuses for that. You know? Are you still going through that battle? Whether you um, want to fight, whether you don't? No, no, no. Not, not really, no. Like, like, even now, like, now I actually want to fight more, which sounds crazy, because now I'm, like, building a, uh, like a brand and, and, and I'm building my record and I'm, I feel like I'm actually, like, in it. At the time when I was doing it, I'm sure I was doing it so half-heartedly. Like my training, I would train so much. I, I lived in the gym. Like and that, that's not putting it lightly. Like I mean, I would, I had full time jobs, and I would go straight from full time job to the to to Roddy's at like five p.m. and I would be like the last one leaving at half nine. I'd be there at half six in the morning training before I walk back in there in the evening. I just done that all the time. So I just enjoy training and enjoy being around the place. And that really shows in in my technical ability. I do believe that like that does show in my technical ability. But I didn't really want to fight that much. But now. That I'm older, I'm kind of like, no, like I, I want to fight. I want to fight. I want to be active. I want to make a name for myself. I want to be, like, when I say it sounds like, like I want to be a superstar. Do you know what I mean? I want to, I want my name to be out there rather mm-hmm. than just being like I think in the past. You used to know, like you all would know this from from seeing the amateur days and all. I, I was always like, no one would ever. You don't really talk about me. Do you know what I mean? I'd fight good lads and my name would be put out there, but it wasn't like I was this uh i know scott scott's good but you just don't you never really fights that much you know what i mean whereas now i want people to be like no scott's good and he's like he's, he's he can be a, a bit of a problem you know what I mean? scott just on the when it came to like the i guess the falling in and out of love of mma yeah. was was it as a sport or would it like would, it, would you have dealt with a lot of nerves in the lead up to fights or like on fight night say would you have been struggling with that oh yeah like every like not 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 overly, you know what I mean? I, I would I was nervous, like like anyone. Like anyone, I was I was nervous and, and I think anyone that tells you that I'm not like I'm not I'm not ashamed to say I don't care. Like it's not to me, I'm like it, it just make a difference to me. Do you know what I mean? If we're going in there to fight, we're going in there to fight anyway. So you're you're nervous, some people are, some people aren't. Um so I think everybody is kind of nervous, but it's how, how you channel those how you channel, into Yeah, yeah. Time. I think I think I channel it a lot better now. I think when I was at amateur, I didn't channel it as well. Um, but but at pro and 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 you know what? I think that comes down to as well as environment it does. Like mm-hmm. like when you're training, like co- like your your confidence comes from your preparation. And some people think they train hard. You know what I mean? They they and I think that might have been a thing that I would have done years ago. Is that I thought I trained hard and I did. I done everything I was capable. Of. But when you're put in a room with where the, the the level is is really really high and it's it's like sink or swim nearly, that that boosts your confidence. That that makes you you really realize you're like, oh, do you know what? I actually am like pretty legit at this. Do you know what I mean? And that that builds your confidence and nearly makes you want to fight more. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And was was that kind of the path that you want to move forward with now, Scott? Over the next yeah. number of years, the decision that you made to join up with Cage Warriors, you know, you you have. You know the Bellators, the PFLs, Octagons, yeah. everyone out there was was rudder offers on the table. Or was it always Cage Warriors for you? Because that's what was like originally supposed to happen. What was your main decision behind wanting to get with Cage Warriors? Um, I think like if, like the PFL route is 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 brilliant. Like I love like I love what 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 PFL are doing for MMA. Like I think anybody who's a fan of MMA or or actually like cares about fighters or, or that side of things has to agree what they're doing is so good for, for MMA and same obviously what Bellator have like had done in the past um, I think with Cage Warriors is I think I, I, I would be more active 
with Cage Warriors. Me personally, like now, not just saying that. I know PFL are looking to make big pushes this year. I think that the Cage Warriors card is there. It's in Dublin. I know that they are going to be active enough, um, and that I think that there's better chances in getting matchups sooner rather than later. And I think for me, time is more of the essence than 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 the route I take. I think if I was a bit younger, I probably would prefer to go the PFL or Bellator route. But with me being a bit older, I think I think the Cage Warriors route might make a little bit more sense. Does that make like does that, does that make sense? Like it so- absolutely does. Yeah. Well, it basically, it's whatever makes sense for you. Like you know, but yeah. it's like we're you you're talking about coming in from your amateur days, right? Where yeah. there is not that much options, really. You know, and and you <laughs> are was- struggling. Yeah. And it's actually a very good scene right now for an up-and-coming fighter or, or even for a fighter like yourself where you actually have those options. You have it's never the been most. Bad. Yeah, no. and it's it's good. But the you, activity was the key reason why you're going to be fighting in the yellow gloves for Cage Warriors. Yeah, really. yeah. yeah. and you know what it is? Well, like, the Cage Warriors have, like, they have that, that name. I know, like, Cage Warriors are around when I was, like, when I was doing amateur and you hear someone fighting the Cage Warriors, they're like, yeah. he's a hardy old boy, that fella. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, so I was like, Franklin was like, I kind of want a pair of them yellow gloves. I'm not going to lie. Like, I do kind of want a pair of them yellow gloves. Like, so that was one of the things that I was like, it keeps me active. But not only that, I, I get the opportunity to find a show that's been around since since I started. Do you know what I mean? It's been there from the get-go. Your debut is kind of in a perfect place because you get to put on the yellow gloves for the first time. And you get to do it in Dublin. Like, it's been, what, yeah. since 2015 is the last time you got to fight in front of a Dublin crowd. yeah. yeah. Day before changed the a lot since then. Well. Yeah, it's day <laughs> almost a decade. Well. I'll be thirty-one on the seventh of April, so I'll be uh, I'll be going down and taking a, a taking this poor man's head clean off his shoulders, and then and then get myself get myself a, a, a night to celebrate. But no, it is it's it is it's nice to fight back in Dublin. I haven't done it in so long, and friends and family always make the big trip up, and I've always been a a, a good. I think from from your pro debut, at least for the last like three cage conflicts, I've been a big a big ticket seller and a, a, a lot of a lot of support coming coming to see me. So it's nice to to finally bring that support back home um, and 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 experience it experience it in a, in a big event. Yeah. Scott, you mentioned there about uh, you know kind of wanting to build your brand and and I guess the, the decision it sounds like to move from SV Charlestown was uh, was love was love and uh, I'm glad to believe you that your your partner is a bit of a, a superstar in her own right. So you know, is this is this like a, a power couple? If you start re- moving up the ranks in cage wars, maybe getting to title contention, we have we this like them. This, Tanya, we, we should just start winging this whole like Tommy Fury and Molly May thing. That's what we need to get going. <laughs> I need to get big enough on cage wars to where they'll let me fight. They'll let me box bin them. On, like, <laughs> on a YouTube card. That's the goal. That's like, let's be honest. Any fighter who tells you otherwise is a lie. I want to box bin men on a YouTube boxing show. So if any of you have any connections, let me know because, like, I'll happily go in and fight any of them. Tell okay, sorry, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, she, uh, the missus is, she works on, on the radio. She's a radio presenter up here and and has a has a, a pretty pretty big instagram following so that would be her her forte would be would be that so a lot of times i come up here and and when i moved up here originally i didn't actually have a name i wasn't it wasn't scott harvey i was melissa riddell's boyfriend for a long time and you get that, stuff. that could be your nickname occasionally yes, yeah, yeah, it could, could, be, yeah, could be so yeah it helps build the brand you know sign me up sign me up <laughs> Yeah. And I know um, that again. I referenced earlier on that when we spoke after your, your fight against Karen Bresnik, you were talking to me about. I, I was like, "Look, do you want to be active now that you you haven't fought in a while?" And you were saying to me, "I need to balance work, my professional life, and my training because it's it's a difficult thing to do." And I know you were you were working as a, as a boxing trainer in, yeah. in Tribe, um, and I saw recently that you you'd left that position. Yeah, was that related to your MMA training, or, or, or you know, how do you approach that that balance? No, now? so so that was so yeah, I I. I'm looking like the, the goal for me eventually is to open up my own gym. Um, my own gym would be would be similar to obviously what I was doing at Tribe. I want to open up my own boxing facility. It's not necessarily an MMA facility. It may it may turn into that. It may grow arms and legs, but that would be my goal, and um, in the future. But I felt like if where I was at with with my professional career in terms of like working in Tribe and things like that, I felt like I needed to 
to branch out and, and start pursuing that. And if I was still working there, it would have would have really held me back in pursuing pursuing opening my own place and and growing myself. So that was one of the, the reasons why I, I parted ways with them, and it nearly just fell hand in hand because I parted ways with them, and then it just gave me so much more time. And, and at the minute, like I coach out of out of Fight Academy in terms, like I do my own PTs and I, I do some of my work there now. And anyway, so. I'm more or less just in the gym all day, every day now, between coaching people or or doing my own training, and and I'm happy to do that for for the foreseeable for the, for the next while, which which really does push push my my MMA career on. Like that's something that I've never done in the past in terms of like every time I have fought or done even through all of amateur like the last three fights, I've I've always worked, I've always done 40, 45, 50 hour weeks. And I was doing really unsociable hours there for for the last three years. I was doing six a.m. to half ten in the morning, say. But then I'm back and work that evening, like five p.m. to eight p.m. And you're doing that every day, so if, like they were all the main times where you want to be training. So juggling it all was quite difficult. But now I'm I'm, I'm a lot more available to train, and it's actually funny because now I always say that like doing MMA just just as MMA and just training. Is, isn't that hard it's not it's not that difficult so like as crazy as that sounds obviously your body's getting beaten up and and you're injury prone and you're tired and those things but trying to do that i'm sure anyone can 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 attest that trying to do that while working 45 50 hours a week is is far more draining and and not having to do that for the time being and i can just focus on mma is, is really helping me develop like big time big time you spoke about starting MMA uh, under own Roddy, yeah. the primal MMA, and mm-hmm. another one of his proteges, uh, a, a tremendous fella, is one of your, your old pals and, and training partners, Ryan Curtis. Uh, obviously, he's going through a battle at the moment. Mm-hmm. How, is, how is he doing? He's doing well. Like He's doing, he's doing well as, 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 as well as, as, as someone can. Like, he, he's he's just incredible uh, and, I, and i mean that like he really is i was i was only in with him again yesterday um and he's 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 just so positive given everything that's happening and, and all that's going on he just has an incredible outlook and you can really see it from mma it's it, it's nearly like transitioned over to like he's he's treating this moment in his life like it's fight camp he's he is improving you know, small small improvements every day He's, he's still such a such a long road ahead of him, and, and the fact that he's mentally he's come to terms with that, and he knows that this road's ahead of him, and he knows that he's going to have days that are really high and days that are really low. But the support he's getting is is out of this world. Like there was, there was probably like every time every time you go down, there's a there's a queue of, of queue of people hanging around outside the same. I think even at this point, the nurses and the doctors are a bit like, Ryan, you need to have less friends than more. <laughs> uh, like, it really is bad. And, like, every time he comes in, he's, like, skitting and slagging off one of the nurses or, you know, like, having a bit of banter with them. And and it's, it's, it's just great to see him. It just lifts your mood. And every time you go in, you leave. Like, sometimes you just take your, grand, your life for granted. Like, I, I do think that that's so... Like if that, that's taught us anything, is it really is. He one thing he used to always say was, was like, you don't, you don't, you don't have to. You get to. You know what I mean? Like, and it's something that he used to always say with his training when he was traveling four hour round trips to the gym, two three times a week. Like, like he was always lucky to be able to do that. And and when you go in and you speak with him, you see how positive he is now. You're, you leave. You're just like, you know what? Whatever's going on in my life really isn't like. It's, it's not like it really isn't it's not important you know what i mean uh, like i'm just and that's why i say all the time i think it's just giving you a new outlook on life really has yeah. to when someone that close to you happens in something that we do every day like how many hours do all like you speak to fighters day in day out how many fighters do you know that spend 10 20 30 40 hours in a gym each week get thrown around the place get ragged all like accidents happen these things happen all the time and it could, it could quickly change our life so so yeah, it's 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 great to hear that there are you know signs of progress. I know it's it's probably small little daily wins. I thought yeah. that the the video that FAI put out ahead of Cage Conflict there yesterday was absolutely beautiful. You know, yeah. uh, Pat McAllister talking about exactly what you're saying. You know, you go up for a half an hour visit, it turns into six hours and two takeaways. Like, <laughs> half an hour visit, and you're you leave three kilo heavier, and 
and tears on your face because you've just been laughing. Like, I think it was myself, Owen Lacey, Adam, um, Robbie were down yesterday, lads from the ISI. Like, I was obviously there and then and they'd popped in to see as well. And we're all just sitting there. Like I said to the missus, I was like, right, I'm going to be home for half three, get ready, I'm going to go to Cage Conflict. And come come half five, I'm only leaving. I'm like, because we're just sitting there, just waffling and just talking crap for, for ages. And, and you just love to see it. He, he handles it so well. Like, he really, he really does. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, looking ahead uh, for the for the year, you've probably got a big year ahead and probably a big career ahead of you with Cage Warriors yeah. now coming up. Um, what's the kind of plan for the year ahead? Do you have multiple fights lo- that you want to take on or uh, what's the goal of Cage Warriors? Like the goal for Cage Warriors is to have a run at that title. It's got to be. Like I think, it's like, um, like I said, the start is my age is one of those things that... that it's not like I'm making it... I make it like I'm like 70. I'm not 70. I seen a mad statistic the other day, though, and I might be wrong, and you can quote me this. It was something like every fighter in the UFC, I think that's four over the age of 35. Is like, or maybe it was like former champion that's four over the age of 30, 35. It was like From the weight class, 125 up to 155, if that is that. They have, I think, the record now after Volkanovski's loss is... One and 22. Two, yeah, two and two and 38 or something like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it doesn't yeah. bode well. When so you're I was getting like, I was 20, like well, push me along here. Let's get these, <laughs> let's get these knocked out. Eight yeah, no... Um, yeah, it would be. It, I would like to. I would like to have a, a run at that time. I think if I have three, four good, successful, big wins, like that bantamweight division, like I think I can do quite well in it. Um, and well, obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a good division. There's, there's there's great fighters in it. I do think I cause a problem though. So, so that's that's the route. That's the route that that, that we're looking to go. Um, and you know, I just love to do it for the lads. And that sounds mad, but like more for them than even for me, which sounds crazy. But I would love to do that for like. For Ryan, for Pat, for Shando, you know what I mean. I would like to just win a belt for them and just bring it back to the gym. That would be, that would be the goal. So that's the plan. I'd like to, I'd like to get two or three in this year um, under the Cage Warriors banner, um, and and hopefully we can. The, the goal would be finishing the year on six and oh, seven and oh. You know what I mean, that's a that's a tidy looking record. And hundred percent. Look, next one, next one up for you is Enrico de Gangi. Yeah. Um, first question, I guess, is what does FAI have with Italian fighters? There seems to be a big <laughs> rivalry going on there. Every time <laughs> I, I see FAI, I, goes... I, I, have, I have no idea. Like every time they offer me some, I'm like, ah, is it another? Italian? I think I'm actually going to just start learning Italian. I, really... <laughs> I start yeah. learning Italian, and then we can just start uh, just like, chat shit to me upon that. I don't really, I don't really bite into all that. But no, the uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. The old Italians, like the last fella as well, was an Italian, and the fella before him. So I was actually matched to fight another fella on cage conflict the lot there in April and I think he, he got injured or whatever whatever happened he had to obviously pull out and then Pietro I think that was his name the last fella I fought M- Mokeki stepped in yeah. Yeah. and 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 he's got that I was another Italian yeah I don't know I don't know what it is but no I'm excited for this fight I think stylistically it's a good matchup um I think style was uh, like um I'm gonna be tricky. I think I think I'm gonna be tricky for him to to deal with. Um, so I think style wise, it's a good fight and smart. Like, and this is another thing as well that like I think was missing in the past is that like sometimes you amateur and I never really made and it doesn't matter at amateur. I know it doesn't matter at amateur, but sometimes you I was just fighting reckless fights that probably weren't the smartest call early on. Do you know what I mean? And and now we're making like smart decisions about opponents and, and and it's not a case of dodging people i've never i don't i'm not dodging them whatever name they give me i'm just like yeah whatever but i can trust that they know that they're making the right calls to it's the right fight to at make, the right time That's yeah to make to make the, the correct decisions on the fights that i should be looking to take to help develop me and, and push me up 100 percent. i think you're exactly going to get that at cage warriors yeah. as well yeah. i think like Ian Dean is so excellent at that. When you're looking at Enrico's game, and obviously you said you match up well with him, is there any particular area that you fancy? Obviously, you're you know you're going to want to go out there and try and get the knockout. I would assume, yeah. but you're you're preparing for all aspects of of the fight. Do you have a prediction on how the fight is going to play out? I think that like you don't really see it in my fights, but I think the boxing is going to be it's going to be a, a real a real issue for him. Um, some that I've obviously in the past have never really. Everyone just assumes I'm just a, a, this, this grappler. I'm just ah, panic grappler, grab on. Ah. But it's not the case. It's, it's it's not, and it's something that I've been working really, really hard to 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 develop because 
if I can bring like eight, like if I can bring seventy or eighty percent of what I'm capable of, like I, 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 I blast his head off his shoulders. You know what I mean? I'm not just saying that being funny. Like I, I do, but it's, he's obviously he's he's a tough fight. He's, he's durable. He's not just gonna lay down and, and accept it. Um, and he's gonna come forward. So, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm anticipating that. And, and but the plan is if if I can if I can get into my rhythm and get things going. Like like I have been doing, it will it will really it will really show. Um, and, and fingers crossed, it's like I'll be pulling away, pulling away. I'm I'm looking for the finish, hundred percent. Scott, it's great to, to hear you talking about that because it's funny as you were I was kinda of laughing to myself there as you were speaking because I was thinking, you know, Scott's really shown himself to be a very pressure heavy grappler, ability yeah. to finish on top so far in his career. Yeah. Uh so it's it's funny to hear you talk about the the boxing as well. So we won't we won't sleep on that. Um yeah. really, really I appreciate the time. This yeah, has been, no, it's been brilliant. Yeah, um, I, I, I have one one last bonus question though. Oh, sorry, you, you mentioned you said you want to be champion. Yeah. The, the champion right now in Cage Warriors 135 is Liam Gittins. Now, he's obviously a lot further on in yeah. his career, 16 fights. You've only had three pros so far. How do yeah. you see yourself today matching up against someone like him? Nightmare. I do. And I'm not like, he's so much further on. I think obviously with Cage, with, with Cage experience, like a lot is to be said for that. Like he has a lot of experience, a lot of experience. But I do think I'm, I think stylistically, I'm, I'm a nightmare for from for most, especially at bantamweight. This is this is one of the reasons why we're going to bantamweight and not and not going the, the featherweight route. Is that I think stylistically I am I, I would be a nightmare. I think I could, I think I could match the, the the pressure. I know he has incredible pressure and he'll move forward a lot and he's not afraid to get hit to, to land the shot. I think I could I think I can match that. Um, not that you want to obviously do that, but I think I would be a little bit crisper, but. Obviously, it's all fun and games saying these things. I've got to, I've got to work and work my ass off to hopefully, hopefully get there. And that's, that's the goal. You're showcasing that new level of confidence, Scott. That's what it's all about, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you realize that, but that's like the perfect uh, like headline. I don't know if you realize you were doing right there. Oh. Scott Harvey, a nightmare for Liam, the nightmare, Liam nightmare Gittins. <laughs> That'll yeah. be in the future. But look, Scott, re- as yeah. I said, we really appreciate the time. Um, give our best to Ryan if you're when the next time you're chatting to yeah, us. No, will. Um, and if if there's anything else, maybe as, as a part of is there anything that we or or anyone who's listening can do to help Ryan other than obviously donate to the GoFundMe yeah um, is, is there anything else that people can do um, just just obviously keep showing support he sees he sees all these messages I think people don't realise because obviously the position he's in right now it's not like he's going to be replying to texts and, and getting back to everyone but but it, we all like when, when I've been seeing him I'm in with him like twice a week two three times a week the Pat more or less lives in the hospital now Shando lives in the hospital like there's always somebody there and we're always reading the, these messages to him and I think it really does just spur him on. So obviously, all the support is 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 incredible for him. Um, there's not a lot that a lot of people can do from the outside. Obviously, everything that people have done so far with donating is huge. And and, and obviously, obviously, if you haven't donated, it, it really does go a long way because it's it's not it, it, like this is life changing. This is like this is a, like the the money that is donated so far is incredible. But he has the rep, like the, he has to live with this for the rest of his life, and, and and we don't know we don't know what the outcome will be in the long run. So, I think that like if you haven't done it, obviously donate. That's some of the best. That's one of the best things you can do for him because it does support him and and, and his family. Um, and then just keep sending the messages and, and, and checking in on him. Because and, and another thing is just don't take what you have for granted. If you can do anything, I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would attest to me saying that is that you just don't take it for granted because we're, we're, we're lucky that we get the opportunity to do what, what we do yeah well said very well said Scott if you if you haven't watched Scott fight before you have an opportunity to do so on the upcoming Cage Wars Dublin uh, yeah. card Scott Melissa Riddell's boyfriend Harvey tune in <laughs> that's it that's it it's now it's now been panned yeah. we'll, 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 we do create nicknames on the ultra angle we have before yeah. in the past so maybe got, this one I, got the name, I got the name Hazard from Ryan that was That's, from Ryan Curtis. Yeah. That was from Ryan Curtis back in Primal because he refused to train with me because he said I was a hazard. And then, <laughs> yeah, he said I was a hazard and then it just stuck from then. So the names come in hot and heavy. His one's the one that just lasted the longest so far. I, th- I think that one might be better. We'll ma- yeah. Maybe go with that one instead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll go with right. that one. Thanks for the time, Scott. Yeah. Chat to you again. Thanks, Mel.
Thanks, man. Right, boys. Cage Legacy 20 uh, in the books right now. Um, a good card overall, I thought. Uh, lots of good fights, lots of interesting fights on it. Um, you know, getting into the card as a whole first, I guess, more so than picking that, uh, picking away at the fights here. Um, you know, good flow on the uh, pay-per-view product. Um, the production was good. Um, I thought uh, there was like they were playing one. So, uh, what the one criticism I have, I and mean, I was joking to you lads about it at the time, watching the the fight. They had a banging dance tune on when the fighters were walking out and in between rounds, but it was the fucking same song every single time. And I was like, it was <laughs> the first two times I heard it, but when you're hearing it for ten or fifteen times, it's like, oh god. He was getting hypnotized. <laughs> I was like, well, that music type of music was like floating me towards the drink to, to open up a can of beer or something like that. <laughs> Do you remember that uh, the Simpsons thing was like, Eva, let me uh, <laughs> join the Navy. <laughs> you want to give me a sick house beat and you'll see me with a can of beer in my hands anyway. But uh, look, at the overall product was, was very good. I want to really highlight uh, how great a job that Paul Brown Nathan Kelly and Sean O'Bannon did on the comms and on the desk. They were brilliant together, and that's not an easy thing. We got a taste of it at the Nationals. Like It's not easy to go in there and talk fights and kind of compliment each other in a three-person boot. Um, they did a fantastic job. It was really well done, and I was talking to Paul, and I said that after him as well, and, and they were all very happy with it as well. So I think, especially, look, Sean has done it a few times. Paul is... is brilliant at that as well it's it's bread and butter to Paul at this stage I thought Nathan Kelly when first time coming in there just slotted in there very very nicely so credit to everybody involved there and uh, what are your thoughts lads Will, should I go to you first about maybe uh, the overall card itself and any standout moments or thoughts on on the product and everything like that you know yeah, we have to talk we, we, we do talk nice about Cage Legacy sometimes as well we don't uh, get highlighted when we talk nice we only get highlighted when we get crit- do a little bit of criticism <laughs> but uh, uh, we have to give credit where credit is due here. And uh, hopefully we're allowed to talk about this too because none of us were there in person as well. But uh, just <laughs> he's just looking, for, <laughs> he's looking for a scrap here. <laughs> if my fucking face ends up on Instagram, I'm blaming you on you. <laughs> Only joking. It's all love. It's all love. It was a great product. And, this is uh, getting clipped up anyway. <laughs> 100%. If you speak good, does it get clipped up? Or, you know, yeah. well, always better for promotion, lads. Um, <laughs> No, look, it, it, I must admit, the quite like I watched it there from I watched it from home, and yeah, the quality was brilliant. Stream was sound. There was no outside of that god awful uh, repeat of music. It was, uh, yeah, the stream was quality. It looked a really good show. It ran quite well. Um, there was a lot like there, geez, there were so many standout moments. Like between, uh, we'll get into them a bit more, but just a quick, few, obviously the. Conor McCarthy finished. That was massive. Yes. Then that leg lock battle in the fight in the uh, in the main event that actually had me grimacing a little bit because I was waiting for someone's knee or something to go. Um, there was so much, and it, I really enjoyed the card. I thought it was uh, it was probably one of their better cards, and I feel like they're setting a bit of a a marker for what's ahead now, especially with the from looking at the next card that they have planned. But uh, overall, brilliant and. Uh, there was a, we got to see two sides of Paul Brown. We got to see the Irish side and he's introduced and that was a big standout moment. And uh, then we got to see Paolo Brown where he switched the Portuguese <laughs> and caught everyone off guard. I didn't know what was going on. I thought, uh, thought some know, random ads you know, starting. I, I hate to keep ramming on about the song, right? But you know what it reminds <laughs> me of? Do you know that priest in Father Ted, Father Billy D- O'Dwyer, when they had the raffle and he only had the one, he forgot his records and he only played the one song the whole time. <laughs> it was very funny, but uh, the fights I itself. Think, I think, ahead. I think, no, just, just on that, because I, 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 because I want to give my thoughts on on the the production. The that song, I think it's because they it's something to do with the, the rights for the yeah, music. Yeah, they can't have they, the rights of any of so, the Walker. Yeah. So I think if if there was a way that they could, it's just a minor. If there's a way that either if you can't do anything, just play. You know, do more than one song. That's grand. If there was a way where they could have just a commentary highlighted, uh, where like let's say Browner's going into the cage, if you had Shauna and uh, Nathan talking about them as they're coming out, I think that that would really add to it because I think that they made some serious improvements with the the video production and the way that they have kind of the spotlight when Browner's announced them. Additionally, I because I've been to that venue and I think that that venue is going to be very commonplace in Irish MMA for the next number of years because it's a good size for a regional show uh, where 
Premier, you know, the difference between where was it, again, Premier, it, it was in, it was. It was in the, the Red Cow, what's it called again? The, the, it's it's called the warehouse warehouse oh, Dublin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when when Premier were there, they it was all standing and it was a little bit hard to see. And obviously, you know, it's the first time in a venue and all that stuff. Cage Legacy learned from that. They had seating, which was I th- I think is is a benefit. And additionally, they had the the fights showing on the big screen, which is incredibly helpful because it's 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 difficult to get a good vantage point in that venue. And I think that helps a lot. Um, really? so you know, they're they're. Uh, like fair fuck their quality those of product are, those, are not thing, those are not things you normally get at regional shows so that's where you're going oh, and, and when we were, we were when we were we were talking shit there, we were, it's all tongue in cheek like it, it, oh, oh no fantastic yeah, product and, and the main event obviously unfortunately for Richie Smullen uh, his original fight uh, fell out he was originally scheduled to take on um I have it written down here, uh, Kirill Medovdowski. That's been rebooked. We'll talk about that later on. But Richie came in against a short notice opponent in, in uh, Marcondes Bastos. And, and it was in a couple of interesting exchanges in the two, a couple of leg lock battles there. But uh, ultimately, Richie gets the job done, winning it by a, a first round TKO. Um, and, you know, a good test for Richie Smullen and, and an exciting fight for um, for however long it lasted, and and a good platform for Richie to kind of start his move towards the UFC, where he he wants to go as well, obviously. But um, it was a good a good main event overall, I think, and a good moment for Richie as well. Quilter. Yeah, yeah, it was. Sorry, I didn't know if you had here or not. I didn't. Um, I didn't. I, didn't, I, didn't sorry. I got you on top there. Yeah, let a name at the end. The two years, yeah, the two yeah. years are looking at me. I was like, I forgot. I'm hosting here. Sorry, boys. <laughs> no, look, yeah, it was good. He got to have that moment in Dublin, you know, like, and uh, it was as I as I alluded to the very beginning. It was a uh, that le- like that leg lock battle had me grimacing. You don't see that very often in MMA, and I don't think fans appreciate that either. Like, it's a uh, some people might not find it the most entertaining, but when you kind of have an un- when you've an understanding of what's going on and realize someone's no someone's knee can go at any moment and uh, how technical and small little detail is involved in that, it's 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 brilliant. It's rare and it's cool to see. I hadn't seen one in ages. I really enjoyed that and actually it stood out for me. Um, but it, yeah, it was a good win risk. You know, it was a. A risky one as well going in against a lad like uh, Marcos. That he, you know, if he lost that, could, would have been a quite the climb back up. But no, he got the win. Good climb back up now to potentially the UFC, as he mentioned. I think he's what he wants. So uh, we'll yeah. see if he can keep that going at the next cage legacy. It was a big shot, Andy, from Richie at the end of that leg lock battle that kind of started the sequence of events for the finish. And he followed up, obviously, with a couple of short elbows and ground and pound as well. And, uh, you know, showed that good level of killer instinct that we would expect from Richie. Like, and it was a great win. And look at look at Bastos went in uh, uh, four and four. But, you know, he had a lot of experience as well and showed that, you know, he was no joke in those kind of grappling exchanges as well. So records can be deceiving sometimes. But uh, overall, a good win for Richie, I'm sure you agree yeah look it's one where Richie just had to go in and, and get the finish and, and it was like, the leg lock battle was gas it was like <laughs> it was like watching someone just roll a wavin pipe across the cage or something <laughs> like they kind of they bash into the other side they go back again like it's like something out of a cartoon you'd see or like a, a fight scene in a movie um, but yeah like I, I thought that Richie kind of was enjoying the, the he's like oh this lad's gonna you know go for leg locks with me this week go crack um he was very dismissive over any sort of danger in it when people were like you know why why did you bother entertaining this um but ultimately once once they they freed the legs up Richie uh it, it only took a matter of seconds really before Richie landed some heavy heavy shots and that's the type of performance we had seen from Richie when he had left Bellator going you know fighting in the Ukraine etc um so I was expecting you know nothing nothing less really than him to go out here and put away this guy in, in the first round. Obviously the Medvedovsky fight was, it was very unfortunate that it, it didn't get uh, come to fruition in the end, but I think it was medicals or something like that. And, and I'm glad to see that it has been rebooked because um, obviously Richie's looking for activity. So you mm-hmm. need to be going, it's, it's activity, but it's, it's activity against the right caliber of opponent. And I think that, uh, you know, Medvedovsky is very experienced. He's fought in a lot of shows, whereas Bastos, he, he wasn't. I think he'd fought on maybe Cage Warriors or something uh, once before. But uh, yeah, I think, I think you know, job done here for Richie and, and on to the next one. Job done as well, Quill Chef, for Conor McCarty. You look excellent in there in the Comey and event. Um, he took out um, Rafael Oliveira, first round KO, uh, high, uh, left high kick, um, we saw him live at the Nationals last year doing it. You know, take this and look at it in the mirror. It was a right foot, right kick the last time, left kick this time, but pretty much the same setup and just 
man, I just can't say enough good things about Conor McCarthy. Such an exciting prospect coming up right now, and he looked excellent in this fight. Showcased a lovely jab, was well in control, all this. And it, it was the type of fight where Conor was in immediate control of the fight and just made the reads, and then he made the decision when he wanted to get uh, Oliveira out of there, and he did so excellently with that uh, left high kick. Yeah, and if you, I think there's a few moments prior to that where he throws that say, I think he throws it once or twice beforehand, and you can see him kind of getting the feel for when, for that kick, and then, as you said, just decided when he wanted to finish it through it, and that was it. The striking was clinical. Um, he looks superb on the feet. Um his rise at the moment, I guess, with how good he looks so early on, it kind of, it has that feeling of the, when Ian Gary went 1-0 and again, when you have that excitement about a prospect. And uh, it's, yeah, it, it look, at the same time, it, your man, um, I'm not sure of how, of his level. He may not be the greatest level, but still, it's great. It's a good starting point for Connor. He looked good, looked sharp. And uh, yeah, a lot to, you know, it's a good way to start your pro career and build on. 100%. And, you know, after the fight, still coming out and saying, Andy, nowhere near his full potential. And I think his ceiling is, is going to ever grow and grow and grow. Sending out Instagram uh, stories a couple of days after this fight. He's back in college. He's studying now until the in the riddle of the year. Do you want to see him take a couple of more fights on the regional scene here, Andy? Kind of get that up to maybe three or four and oh. Do you think maybe, you know, we spoke to him, you know, he's not ruling out anything or going anywhere, or you, whether it's Cage Warriors, PFL, Belt, or wherever. Is it a thing for you, for Conor McCarthy, do you like to kind of just see him just build up to maybe three, four, five wins on the regional scene and then move on, move forth into maybe some of the, the bigger organisations? Yes, absolutely. Um, firstly, he needs to finish college or he'll get an absolute hiding from his mom, but it says because <laughs> he keeps taking fights when he's supposed to be studying. Um, but yeah, like I think if we're, uh, you know, assuming that, that he doesn't do that, uh, we're probably not going to see him again until maybe, you know, June uh, would be would be my guess. So I think uh, I just want to see him fighting actively over the first, say, two years of his career. Um, and I think it's brilliant. It's really, really stood out to me where when he's talked about you know I'm not I'm nowhere near my full potential I think that's an amazing uh, an amazing you know it's a really positive mindset to have you know it's it's that kind of buzzword like that growth mindset or whatever um when you're early on and you know you've lads kind of you've people hyping you up and saying you're this and that and you've all this potential to stay grounded and just focus on I have a long way to go I have a lot of skills to develop and a lot of experience to gain and I think by fighting regularly on the regional scene for the next you know year and a half and then then wherever you go that that, that will get you to uh to to the level you need to get to um you go from there so whether that's like I wouldn't mind seeing fighting on, on the Irish scene for the next few and then maybe you know taking a few in, in Europe somewhere whether it's Cage Wars whether it's PFL whether it's wherever after that um, be interesting to see 100% yeah the other pro fight Andy and I'll stay with you because you know you highlighted Georgie Grozov uh, ahead of his professional debut he made it seven wins in a row for him amateur and professional obviously this was his professional uh debut here but a really really impressive performance and definitely you know you said it and he's a guy to be we need to be looking out for as well coming from team Hulan martial arts we got another one there from from paddy Hulan's stable of fighters uh really good win there by georgie yeah this was domination really um you know as soon as he got that body lock he took it to the ground uh and from there it was only a matter of time before he was landing heavy shots, obviously, in the, the pro rule set now. So he started to land a few elbows. His, his teammate, Sean, uh, was on the comms. And uh, he just really, he looks like he's he's adding to his game each fight, which is is brilliant. It's brilliant to see because, uh, you know, uh, Browner kind of highlighted this in the post-fight interview with him where he was saying, you know, I met Paddy Hulahan. Uh, after one of his first fights and he's like you know what what's he like he goes he's you know good good graphing good jiu-jitsu he's 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 a long way to go and he's long a lot to learn and uh he's learning he's learning quick uh, and he's adding and he looks he looks a right terror so um he's going to be one to another one to to watch as we said uh moving forward so uh I, I, i'm just looking forward to to watching him compete again yeah, hundred percent. I am as well. Um, there's nothing scheduled for him for the twenty one card yet, is there? I didn't see anything, but maybe that might be a, a possibility uh, for him. But Quilcha, well, maybe Andy. I don't know if you wanted to look that up, but um, let's talk about the company. The amateur for the twenty one card. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, he's not on it just not, yet. Not on it as of yet, but you know, no, no, there's a few good pro fights on that now, though. But yeah, like, there sure is, and that card is kind of filling up as well. Quilcher, I was going to ask you about the double uh, set of amateur titles that were on the line. Alex Fagan went out there, put on a, a good performance, won a split decision in a close fight against Reno Flatterty. Um, that was for the um, amateur welterweight title, also for the amateur bantamweight title, a, a fight that I was really looking forward to and was shaping up quite nicely until the unfortunate end was Jake Nye, who went out there and uh, beat Fofa Fares uh, via first-round technical knockout due to uh, unfortunate... Uh, yeah, Fofa Fares got, got sick inside the cage, and we've seen that once before, and obviously the fight needs to be called in that situation. Two good fights, um, two lots of good talent on show there in both title fights. Any thoughts on the fights themselves? Yeah, look, we were left wanting more from one. I think it's fair to say that. That looked, that was... Like shaping up to be a really good potential th- uh, three round fight, and I'm not sure I could have got could have got a finish in there as well somewhere. But um, that was shaping up to be really good until whatever happened happened is what it is. We got to see Derek Hickey uh, show off his uh, mop and skills during the during the break then between the fight. But uh, <laughs> look, hopefully we get to see that rebooked because I think it's a really good fight. I think it's a really good fight, and uh, it'd be nice to see them kind of settle. Settle this one now after what happened. In terms of the next one, though, the uh, you know, Fa- Free and Flaherty and Alex Fagan fight, that was really, really good. It's ex- it was exciting. Lots there was, you know, was lots of grappling. I couldn't call it. Is the best way I, to be uh, to put it. I couldn't call it when it was going to decision. I was looking at the screen, thinking, Do you know what? Don't know. Whoever wins it wins it. But this is that was brilliant to watch. Um, great matchmaking once again. And I, I got to give Cage Legacy a lot of good, a lot of credit for the matchmaking with the title fights in this one. Um, and oh, fair play to Alex Fagan he looked fantastic in that fight as did Reno Flaherty the God. Reno Flaherty uh, the, the escape from the guillotine was phenomenal where where Fagan kind of was lifting him up and <laughs> and a Flaherty like jumped into the air and turned his body and managed to escape it was brilliant like a salmon out of water one would say but uh, um, lot, like you mentioned matchmaking and Andy lot, good matchmaking brings close fights and it was another close fight between Keen McCartan and Henry Leica, a uh, fight that finished in split decision that Keen McCarthy just got his hand raised. Uh, you know, another close one. I think the decision was right, in my opinion, but it was a great fight. Uh, with Keen, a brilliant win and a brilliant post-fight speech as well. I agree with that. You know, it's it's down in the notes here. Um, he, he called for a shot at the belt. He's shown that level that, you know, he, he I, without saying what anyone deserves or what doesn't deserve, but I think it was a performance and a win against a tough opponent, opponent that would warrant a title shot at the very least anyway, Andy, wouldn't you think? Yeah, like I, again, flyweight, I, I, I cannot talk about amateur flyweight or, or even some of them are moving on to pro now as well in this country enough. Another really, really fun fight. Um, I thought it was close, but I thought that as the fight wore on, McCartan imposed his will more, landed more damage, went for the toe hold uh, at one point as well. He threw up a, a flying triangle attempt at one point. And Lekka, you know, Lekka had a, I think the first round was very close. McCartan probably edged the, the second one. And then I had, uh, you know, I thought that the third was the clearest for McCartan. And he absolutely deserves it. Like, if you look at who he has fought as well at an amateur, he's really, like, you know, he is probably a mixed bag as far as his record goes. But he, I first watched him against uh, Dmitry Pankov in the IMAS. And that was, your man Pankov was like, just destroying lads and he lost that one but since then he's fought Aaron Henry Kieran Coogan Shea Cleland Damian McGuigan and now Henry Lecca all on the Irish scene and like that's that's a who's who uh, of flyweights in the country so um, it's standing to him I think that he's really starting to to showcase some improvements here um, and yeah I'd love to see him get a crack at a title yeah big time uh, just a quick quick run through of the uh, the prelim section of the car Jordan Rooney picked up a good t- TKO win over uh, Sean Black, uh, Nicolay Shiopu took out Jack Newman by submission. Adam Murphy uh, took out uh, Lochran Enright by KO. Uh, the opening fight of the night, Evan Horgan took out Yuri Malenkov by decision on that card. Overall, uh, brilliant card, like we said. You can actually head over to YouTube, Cage Legacy TV on YouTube, and watch those fights if you haven't seen them as well. And a couple of fights too. Well worthy of anyone checking out if you haven't seen them already. One more, Andy, you have? One no, more. Just, just to highlight that, Browner has named another submission of the show The bar. The show that, that, bar. And yeah. we, have to give, we have to give him credit yes. in Conor McCarthy's fight for announcing the fight, uh, one of the fighters in Portuguese. Yeah. Unreal. I couldn't really, I, was, I immediately messaged him. I was like, what? I love it. I love it. 
brilliant uh there's little little uh, uh intricate things like that that make it a, a little bit different and that's why paul is so good at what he does um we moved from cage legacy to cage conflict uh an event that happened last weekend uh, a couple of professional fights on the card in the main event Eamon dean uh took on andrea merzario i won by first round tko standard win uh it looked really good on the feet with all due respect to everyone it was a, it looked to me a little bit like a mismatch to be fair obviously fights got pulled and we want to try and get fighters on this card we understand that but it looked like you know Eamon Dean was at a much higher level than, than Andrea his opponent in there Andy um, you know and I think that's pretty fair to say but nonetheless you gotta go in there you gotta get the job done he looks slick he looks smooth on the feet and uh, I think when we were criticising we just want to see maybe a, a higher level of opponent so that we can see Eamon showcase his abilities more than what he was able to on Saturday and he got the job done with relative ease of the first round TKO. Yeah, well, like, so we, we talked about this ahead of this and we were looking at, the, we're saying, you know, he's fighting a guy who's three and eight, but for context there, we were kind of expecting, okay, this this may, this may has the possibility of being a, a, a mismatch, but you were going in and Eamon Dean had one single MMA fight, which was obviously the one against Troy Gibson and this guy had 11. So I, I, I would get, definitely give some leeway for that. But now we know Jesus Christ, Eamon Dean is, is, a, Very is a handful. Is a fucking handful and he's a terrifying looking fighter. And like, I think you could, to me what stood out was his confidence from literally the opening bell was like through the roof. And he, I, I felt like he was playing with his food from the very first second. You know, he he opened with a low kick into a left hook into a, I think it was a spinning back kick to the body, and then was it a, a an elbow or a flying knee or something? And he landed with every single one of them. Uh, he he is crisp, he is precise, he is powerful, and he is a guy who already two two he's had one uh, was it one amateur fight and one pro fight, and like oh, amateur in, fights. Uh, was that amateur? Right, who are both, both, they're, they're both pro, they're both pro fights. Sorry. They're both pro, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, like, didn't even have any amateur fights. Uh, he's ready for a step up in competition, a significant step up in competition. Because if he goes in against Lance, like, right, we, ready we, for him, we, he's gonna, we destroy. didn't know that. I mean, you're not going to go out and beat Troy Gibson either, and yeah. you know, without like Troy Gibson's at a high level as well. But your, your point is 100% valid, like, records can be misconstrued sometimes, but, but, like, it, we but, can, but you're we, right, like, it, it yeah. The evidence is the fight itself, <laughs> and very clearly it was a mismatch. Yeah. Like he he destroyed him. Brilliant stuff, no, a very a, a exciting guy to watch. His aim and Dean just silky smooth on the feet, and uh, he's got. I, I'd almost call him the Louvre. He's got so much artwork on him as well, with all these tattoos and everything. It's uh, it's quite the picture for Eamon Dean. You remind me of uh, Colin Fletcher, you know. Yes, you know, Colin yeah, Fletcher, yeah, yeah. Like, all yeah. head, all the tattoos, and scary. That's it, yeah. Very scary looking individual and very scary looking individual when he is throwing punches and kicks as well. Big, big win for him. Really looking forward to seeing what's next for him. In the co-main event, Quilche, Henry Corrigan picked up a win over Francisco de Lorenzo uh, via first round sub, a rear naked choke. Another good win for the FAI man. Yeah, he came out early here with the kick and he was, you could tell straight away that this one, I don't think it was going to go on very long. Bit better. He was a bit better of an opponent than uh, and than Eamon Dean had, but uh, yeah, as soon as I saw Dorenzo go for the Kimura, I remember saying to you guys, I knew straight away it was going to be an RNC. The way he was exposing himself like that, um, you could tell that there was a he probably wasn't at the level in grappling as Henry was, and that was all she wrote there. A few few seconds later, when Henry got the choke in, uh, or got the back up choke in, and. Yeah, a good win for him. He moves to three and zero. Hopefully, uh, a big step or not big, a relative step up in competition next, uh, and maybe a bit more of a competitive fight than this what we saw on the weekend. But a very exciting fly, another flyweight prospect another flyweight, coming out yeah. of FAI. Big lots of prospects coming out of FAI on in the flyweight division as well, and that was a good win. And uh, Henry picked up the pro flyweight title there at Cage Conflict. Corey McLaughlin. Uh, took on uh, Yuri uh, Mazzasetti. Also a submission, Andy, in this one, a rear naked choke as well. FAI's uh, love affair with Italian mixed martial arts fighters continued in this one. We had a little bit of a, a joke with Scott there in the interview and saying, what what did they have? But look, it's, it's 
it's nice to kind of create that. We used to always exist back in the day. You used to get the England versus the Ireland fight. So you understand bringing in a ta- talent that you can't always pit Irish stars against Irish stars. So um, this was another good win for, for Corey McLaughlin here uh, for the amateur flyweight title. So we've seen an amateur pro in Henry Cargan. We saw... Uh, a t- I think this is a fe- featherweight, featherweight. Oh, featherweight. Sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, featherweight. Sorry, excuse me. What's yeah, your thoughts this, on that? this was this was a a really solid performance for Corey. I, I've been very impressed with Corey last one. This was his fourth finish on the bounce, um, and he thought he went in there. He looked good on the feet. He was, you know, he, he landed the right hand a number of times. I thought he was he was kind of, uh, he, I thought he he clipped him a couple of times. He looked like he kind of he stu- stuttered him or, or or you know they were very impactful shots. Uh, and then he pulls it off with the with the buzzer beater. You know, choke at the end to to seal the deal in the first round. So, uh, another solid performance from him. Now becoming the, the champion, of, uh, the amateur champion in in that uh, in that uh, that organization. And he's fought like some good guys, like you know James Slavin. I was impressed with who's who fought on the card that that, that night. Also got a win. Um, he's he's finished him now. He finished Alex Josan, Nathan McGillian, who are all solid fighters. Um, so I think he's he's another one to to watch in the amateur. There's so many that uh, yeah. it's really the amateur is. It's been really, really fun to watch the last couple of years. I, I, I will give all the thanks in the world to Quilch Debar because you, you were looking at this long, <laughs> the amateur scene long before I was. I tell you that much. And uh, yeah, it's it's really, really fun to watch at the moment. Any uh, any other highlights on the card, Andy? If you want to take us through some of the rest of the fight, some of the standout performances. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go through them. So uh, as I mentioned, the aforementioned James Slavin got a first round TKO over Paddy Moran. You know, it was, it was a fun fight for as long as it lasted. Um, really kind of fun exchanges on the feet. Um, and then eventually there was a bit of a, a protest from Moran um, of the stoppage, but I, I think it was it was a fair one. Kind of Slavin had some kind of heavy pressure on the back. He took the fight to the ground and flattened him out. Um, and finished them. Uh, Owen McDonald uh, won the interim bantamweight title, defeating Rory Burke. Um, so that was a really another really fun fight. I, to be honest, watching this one, I couldn't tell you who won. Um, I, I thought that each round was was very, uh, very, very close. I may have edged it for McDonald. Uh, but again, I couldn't really call it. I thought it was the fight of the night. I thought that the two lads, you know, it, it looked very high level uh, on the comms. They were talking, saying, you know, this could be a pro fight, and, and I fully agree. Um, I think, you know, while there was, you know, while Owen McDonald emerged victorious with the title, both lads look very, very promising. Um, you know, we've, I've seen Rory Burke compete a, a few times before, and so no surprises there. Um, again, the the um, the middleweight title was won by Ben Johnson. So it was a, that was a hard fought win against Gareth McCormick. Um, I was dual screening some some fights during this one. I won't lie. It was, it was hard. It was hard but, uh, Johnson had landed some big slam takedowns. I thought McCormick looked good early, but Johnson kind of came into it as the fight wore on. And then the, the one I suppose that caused the most controversy of the card was the the Jed Paolo. Uh, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name wrong. I don't know if it's Jed A. Paolo or Jed Paolo, um, Jess Paolo's brother. Defeated Michael Shields uh, by a split decision. So it was 29-28, 28, 29, 29, 29. Now, I personally had this card, this this fight scored 30-27 for Michael Shields. And I know there was there was big uproar. The comms team were, were not happy with the decision. Um having said that, I I think Michael Shields won it. I if I was given my own scorecard, it would have gone 30-27. I have not gone and watched it back. But Shields had a lot of control and a lot of dominance in the grappling and there wasn't a lot of shots coming off the back of that so there wasn't like much damage landed now having said that uh, so I do think like that's something you know obviously this is amateur you, you want to build on that so that you know in future fights you can really put your stamp on rounds etc so that's something for him to work to you know factor in moving forward but I didn't see much coming back from Jed Paolo either so you know where there was maybe a couple of pot shots here and there from either of them. I I thought that Shields won every round, um, and I think especially in amateur, you know, I I was very surprised by the decision. Um, so I think it's you know, well within their rights to feel a bit a bit aggrieved by that one. Um, but at the same time, it that's look, it's 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 good that it happened at amateur, and it's a learning one where you know Shields looked really really dominant, but he just needs to land some you know when he's in the half guard and and, and half mount. Just, just land a few more shots or push shots here and there and rack up the score, um, because yeah, it'll stand to him in, in time, and especially when you get to pro rounds and five minutes and all that, yeah. um, bigger cages, etc. Um, it'll, it'll, it'll stand to him. But look, Paolo, um, Paolo got the win in the night, and and, and that's that. 
Hundred percent. Anything else that we missed out on that car quilter that's worth mentioning? Anyone that uh, impressed you before we move on to take a look ahead of what the action is going on? No, I think we've kind of got everything there. Kinda, and he's given us a good run through. Uh, I can only echo in terms of the one that the fight that stood out the most. Oh, McDonald, Roy Burke, hats off to them. That was an absolute cracker. Um, yeah, I was fully invested in that fight when I was watching us glued to the screen. Didn't care yeah. about who, who won in the end. It was just brilliant to watch. Two brilliant cars, obviously Cage, Legacy, Cage, Conflict, uh, fair play to all involved there for sticking on, obviously, you know, proceeds uh, of the Cage Conflict show going to the uh, Ryan Curtis and, and his fight for um, to, to get back um, uh, healthy as well, it was a good uh, thing to kind of add and have um, for support for Ryan as well, I kind of butchered that a little bit, Laz, but how is it never, we shall move on. Uh, go ahead, Andy. One more. No, no, I didn't, I didn't, I'm we, sorry. We, we need to bring in a new segment now, a new little jingle when Andy has. I can't help it. I can't help it, lads. The just like we were talking about with Cage Legacy, where we had Nathan and we had Sean on comms there. We had Reese McKee and John oh, McCoggan, yeah. and I just love this. I love seeing this in Irish MMA, where you've got you know former Cage Warriors champions, UFC fighters, PFL fighters that are you know, involved on the, on the amateur scene, the regional scene, the, the you know, local pro fights and, and on the call. I think it's brilliant. Uh, yeah, just, that's all I'm about to say. I probably didn't need to add that, but. No, 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 it's well, no, we get, we, you we know get, me, uh, give you know credit me. where credit is due, but uh, lots of talent on show with those two cards and we can look ahead. Uh, lots of talent on show and two other cards we're going to speak about real quickly as well. We'll take a quick look at Ur Fighting Championships 10, the 10th show, March 3rd, Deck, uh, um, Decky McAleenan's uh, organization, uh, Ur, will be back with an absolutely banging main event, to be honest. Uh, that's Damian McGuigan, FAI's Damian McGuigan, uh, for fighting for the Pro Fiveway title against Shea Cleanan from Team Torres. We'll see the return of Tiernan Lochran. Obviously, we, we forgot to mention his fight fell off the cage conflict card, unfortunately, at the at the final uh, hours before that was supposed to take place. He will be matched up on Ur. Fingers crossed that. No confirmation on what an opponent is going to be for Tiernan yet, but I'm sure they're working hard on getting that done. Sam Simon versus Jordan Scully. Andrew Barrett versus Vladimir Stanku. Ah, oh, man, like, I mean, looking down through this card, there's Senan Coakley as well against Mantis Vasilius. Quilja, I mean, Ur, the gift that keeps on giving, man. Uh, you know, fantastic matchups here again. Yeah, it's always, the matchmaking's always top tier in these. Like, I think, didn't Decky say it before, he just kind of makes the fights that uh, he thinks to be good or he wants to make. There's no kind of other bit to, other kind of motives to it. It's just brilliant. And uh, it's always, it seems very structured. Even with the, the titles, I don't think he gives anyone a title, uh, a title shot that hasn't fought there before and stuff like that. Um, I, yeah, I love, I love these cards. Result, well. they're very, it's always very structured. It's um, and they're always really competitive and stacked. Like this is, I can't even count the amount of fights are on this card, but uh, but absolutely brilliant. Uh, any any one, one fight that's really kind of tickling your fancy now, heading heading into the card. The main event, uh, Damian McGuigan versus Shea Cleveland. I uh, think Damian McGuigan's just been on this tear. And he's so exciting. He's probably, you know, we're only seeing him very early on in his career to a point now where he could go on to have a very bright future. And uh, we've kind of been along along the ride with him now watching all these fights. So uh, I'm excited to see how he gets on against Shea Cleland. And Shea in his own right is just, he's always in good fights. He's extremely well-rounded. And I feel like he could give Damien his toughest fight today as well, you know. So uh, yeah, look, that's the one for me, I think. Brilliant fight, brilliant matchmaking. Uh, a couple more after that, Andy, I'm sure. Anything else that's really standing out to you? Anyone that you're particularly looking forward to seeing? Like, we could go on for ages about this card, to be honest, but uh, anything that's standing out to you? Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, the King of Hell back. The King of the Hell. King of Hell, Andrew, Andrew Barrett, Barrett, and he's taking on one of the Stanker brothers. Uh, that one really piques my interest. As you mentioned, you know, Decky, Decky just puts on proper fights and proper matchups. And uh, yeah, I'm looking, you know, we haven't seen him now since... September 2022 was the last time he fought it. That was at the IMF European. So it's been a while since we've seen Andrew Barrett compete. And, you know, he, he had put together a, a really solid 2021, 2022, where, you know, his name was was kind of circling a lot of the time because you're seeing him compete so often and, uh, at home and abroad. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, where he's at at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't say enough things about that, that main event. And then obviously there's, uh, there's some other... Um, you know, uh, Kevin Keogh versus Michael Cronley, Senna Coakley versus Madison, you know, some of the ones that we've already mentioned. 
there's, there's a lot of fights here that, that I'm, I'm interested to see. Sam Simon versus Jordan I'm looking forward Scully. to that one. Sam, that's yeah. a good clash of styles, that one now as well. And, you know, Sam has been on a good rise and Jordan has been uh, on a good rise as well. So, yeah, like I said, lots and lots of fights to look forward to on that card. That's March 3rd. We fast forward another week. We got Clan Wars on March 9th, I believe it is. Um, that is on... Yeah, I think March you're right there. Ninth, yeah, March 9th. And we got another uh, Matthew Friel versus Jamie McAleese fighting for a, a pro flyweight title as well. It's all about the flyweight squeal shit. What's going on? All flyweight fights here. Jesus loves flyweights, lads. Um, yeah, it is never just... Die. Fly never die. Fly never die. Yeah, look, it's the flyweight scene's just booming at the moment. Amateur and pro. Um, and the way it's going, we could end up with... Ireland could end up with more than one flyweight at fighting at the highest level in the UFC at some point and not in the near future with a couple of years time but uh, ah, it's exciting I love flyweights uh, they need I always feel like remember when Dana White tried to drop flyweight division always made me love the flyweight division even more so uh, fly never die as you say one might say Ben Askren saved the flyweight division so <laughs> no, with, with, uh, yeah, you could you could yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, like, you guys get what I'm saying right? I didn't, you didn't give me yeah, the no, no. it was, it was a brilliant there, it was a brilliant it was a brilliant trait it was a brilliant yeah, trait it, was, but, it uh, wasn't Henry Cejudo it was Ben Ben Askren yeah for sure for sure um, but yeah Clan Wars as well putting on another good look at um, we, we see uh, Lewis Byrne in co-main event there as well Andy um, against Jossie Adeki a couple of other great fights on there. Emma Core back in action against Damian McKenna. That's a fight that I think is going to be a barn burner as well between those two guys. Um, Milo Martial Arts, obviously Miles Price from close to home for me. Uh, we have Paul Nolan. We have also um, Lee Randall on the card as well for Milo Martial Arts. When you're looking at the card as well, anything else that's standing out to you, Andy? Anyone that you're looking forward to seeing? Yeah, well, like, I, I'm interested to see Matthew Friel make his professional debut. I know he's he's, he's right at the top of the card. I, I don't think that's for a title. I think it's just a, a regular pro fight. Um, but oh. he's a guy who, like, he's fought everyone. Like, I, I know, I, it'd be interesting because he's coming off a vicious knockout. Like, that, you know, the, for anyone who hasn't seen Damien McGuigan fight, just to, to throw back to that or card that's coming up, go and watch his his finish of, of Matthew Friel back from back in August. He had a spin and heel kick KO. Oh, so... You know, uh, Matthew Friel has fought, let, let me just go through who he's fought here, right? So he has fought Kieran Mulholland. He's fought Owen Ch- uh, Chelmia. Do you know your man who's fighting yeah, over in Great uh, combat. Great yeah, combat. Yeah. He's fought Jamie Abbott-Bissett, Carl McConway. Uh, I think he's fought Gary Rooney twice. He's fought Kieran Coogan. He's fought Damian McGuigan. Like, he's fought a who's who of, of flyweights in Ireland. So he's taken all the fights. He's he's probably a 50% record at at, uh, at amateur. So it'll be very interesting to see now him, him making the pro uh, transition. Uh, but yeah, there's another lad who... Uh, I'll, I'll put my hand up. I haven't seen him fight a whole lot, but I've been hearing big things about this Billy Sutherland. Another, yeah, another flyweight. Yeah. He's 6-1 and one fighting out of IFS. Um, and he's a guy who, I think it was, I put up the, when we put up that video of uh, Nathan, Nathan, uh, Nate Kelly, Nate the Great yeah. Kelly talking, there was so many comments about like, F- Billy Sutherland, Billy Sutherland, Billy Sutherland, give him him, he'll destroy him, he'll destroy him. So I, I haven't seen much of Billy Sutherland, I'm going to be completely honest, but he's he's on a, a serious tear at the moment and, and I will be tuning in from this time. Absolutely, absolutely. Two great cards coming up, obviously we're, uh, we were fighting championships March 3rd Cage uh, or Clan Wars 49 on March 9th we're looking forward to that we'll do a full breakdown of all those cards on the next uh, Owl Triangle episode couple of housekeeping notes here guys before we finish up um, couple of n- news uh, stories that have broken obviously we've mentioned already Richie Smullen and Kirill Medodovsky rebooked for Cage Legacy 21 that fight fell off of the Cage Legacy 20 card um, that is rebooked for Cage Legacy 21. Dennis Frimpong back in action uh, at Octagon 56 in Birmingham on April 20th. Uh, he will take on Callum Mullen. Back, uh, it's good to see Dennis back in action after an impressive win last time out. Will Fury obviously signing for Octagon uh, and uh, takes on Daniel uh, Skibor at U- Octagon 56 in Birmingham on uh, April 20th as well. Paddy Rutledge pro debut against Antonio Santana at uh, WOW 13 in Sevilla um, on wow. March 23rd. Wow, yeah, wow. That great great name for uh, your 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 boy Martin McNulty Quilcha is in action as well against uh, who? Uh, Sayo and. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I, I, I need I need an Irish abroad section for the lads like Paddy Roblish, yeah. Martin McNulty, and McKinley Adiemi to be honest, you lads. I go off on Instagram finding these all sorts of Irish lads, and uh, yeah, he's, he's he's fighting on Kong's FC. I don't even know how to say where this place is in France, but he's fighting flyweight again. Last two falling apart. Hopefully this one goes ahead, to be honest with you. Hopefully it does. Or Ian saw his life flash before his eyes when he saw that. He's like, I think I need to sit down. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? It's like, oh, the, the never-ending struggle with me and names will, will be a battle that will continue to go on. McKinney uh, Ademe, another guy that you kind of highlighted is over uh, in my neck of the woods, uh, fighting out of Vancouver as well, picked up a a, a win over Shari in Spain at the 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 Koga Conga or the Koga Combat Game seventy eight in Washington. A good win for him as well. So, um, lots of other stories as well. Is there anything else, lads, that we have to highlight or anything that we've missed uh, before we kind of wrap it up for episode fifty one? Anyone at all? The floor is open. I was robbed um, against Sean Denny in the. MMA mm. quiz, MMA severe MMA mastermind. Um, that's all I have to say. Andy that's out. To speak. How, how, how far do I go, Rito? Um, Andy out. Um, Andy out. We're still the first round when this out. So um, you know my my match first match up coming up as well. It'll be interesting to see. You know, Quilcha will be representing uh, the L Triangle in the semi finals. So. Actually, actually, hang on a fucking second now. You, you prick. I mean, we're here. hosts. No, no, you're, you're lovely, Quilch. You're lovely, <laughs> Ian. I mean, like, I, I'm, Jot. I'm in, I'm in a battle to the death with Sean Denny, and and who comes in as his phone a friend? Who comes in as his phone a friend? Uh, my oh my co-host, my my beloved Ian O'Neill. Andy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologise. I must have been hard. It wasn't an no, easy no, decision to not make. Accepted. Oh my god! I can't believe it. <laughs> he Drama. answered for me, so. Uh... You know, clearly shows he's got a favorite co host, to be honest. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. That's it. Look at that. The severe MMA match. If you haven't checked that out, it's really cool. We uh, all face off with one another over the course of a quarterfinals, semi finals, and finals. Check it out over on the Severe MMA YouTube. It's a good bit of crack. You can play along as well if you want to play along with us. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, one thing I will say a lot of Chris is Tiernan and Lochran here coming out, fucking throwing shots. Name. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of fucking sit back and criticize, but you know, it's not easy when you're under the bright lights of MMA Mastermind and you're put on the spot for some of these questions. Sometimes you get into a flow, but sometimes you know you'll kind of get a couple of brain farts and stuff like that. Put the cow tit down, Tiernan, and, and, and <laughs> step up to the plate and you know, <laughs> yeah. do some trivia, will you? That's it. Yeah, if you're going to talk to talk, you got to walk the walk. So maybe we'll be able to make something like that happen down the line, but. That's it for episode 51. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Scott Harvey. Fantastic interview from Scott. Scott, and I'm very excited to see him um, make waves in Cage Warriors as well. He'll be fighting on April 6th. Um, lots of action as always. We have plenty to discuss, and we'll have plenty more to discuss in a couple of weeks' time when we're back for episode 52 as well. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Give us a share. Give us a follow. And share the love. We appreciate the support as always. And now all is left is for Quilcha de Barra to see us out. One more thing. Not sure if next time we're gonna it's gonna be Shocked and Gwerg is nearby. We might do something. I always finish this episode, the episodes in Irish. So uh Gurmy. Quilcha pulling an Andy here. <laughs> I am shocked <laughs> by that. I am shocked. <laughs> is this what it's like when I do it? <laughs> was it bad? <laughs> no, I love no, it. No, 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 all right, Gary. What, what, no, oh, no, yeah, no, 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 I did. You interrupted. <laughs> um, what's it called? Oh yeah. By the time we do the next episode, it'll be shocked in the Guaya Gap. Not sure if we're gonna do something on severe or out triangle or whatever it is. But um, I think we t- joked about it before between us. But sure, look, who knows? We might see. And because I finished the podcast in Irish every week, Gary and Margaret, I'm